Chapter 18, Part 2 of 40,000 Miles Over Land and Water. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Betty B. 40,000 Miles Over Land and Water by Ethel Gwendolyn Vincent. The Cities of the Great Mogul, Part 2. Bright and fresh we rose the next morning, under the influence of looking forward to seeing the Taj for the first time. We all know that it is worth coming to India, if only to see the Taj, and we thought of this as we drove down the well-known road constructed during the famine of 1838. The Taj Mahal is, I think, the most beautiful, the most heavenly of all earthly conceptions, of all earthly creations, of all works raised by the hand of man. In the midst of this land of glorious monuments, the Taj shines forth as the one thing of perfect beauty. Apart from the loveliness of its outward and earthly form, it stands there as some silent finger pointing to the sky, an intuition of the quiet beauty of death. It is as if Shah Jahan, even in his heathen darkness, conceived some vague idea of a higher world, another life, as if he felt that by transferring the remains of his loved one to the most beautiful resting place on earth, he was lifting her up to a higher sphere. He seems to have tried to embody some such idea in the monument which will immortalize his name and the memory of the lovely Mumtaz to whose honor it was erected. It was his way of showing the passion of his love, the erecting of this most beautiful mausoleum that the world had ever seen. We may think it was the work of an ignorant and barbarous mind, but after all it is the form of expression of sorrow which is unhappily must common with us until this day. The Taj was built in 1648. No wood or stone was used in its construction, for it was built entirely with Jaipur marble, which still retains its pristine purity of whiteness. The approach to the Taj by the straight strand road, with the first view of the marble dome over some trees, communicates a pang of disappointment, but as we pass under an old stone gateway and find ourselves in a quaint native court, the scene grows more in harmony. This court leads us out before the great red gateway. It is very handsome, formed of red granite, inlaid with white marble. It is topped with a series of little cupolas or umbrellas that count the curiously uneven number of eleven. Two slender towers that flank the gateway look spiral from their running zigzag pattern. The broad square which frames the arch is covered with sentences from the Koran, those being chosen which speak of comfort and consolation to the morning. The irregular and disjointed letters of the Arabic alphabet form a very effective and bold decoration of the arch, and the contrast between the white and red marble is most striking. Passing through, we are under the great dome of this gateway, which is covered with a mosque pattern of crossed triangles. A man with designs of the Florentine mosaic on plates and vases, etc., distracts our attention. We turn and see the mirage of a pure white temple, the glory of the Taj. The gateway forms a grand frame. The scimitar crossing the dome just touches the keystone of the arch, and the sides seem to widen out just enough to admit of a complete view of the furthest outlying cupola and tower. The first startling effect of dazzling brilliancy is very great and deep and lasting. It is here that the Taj became indelibly imprinted on my memory. It is as seen from here that I always recall its now familiar lines. The stupendous marble dome, crowned with the golden scimitar, is the central object, the first that absorbs the attention of the eye, but gradually the towers and the cupolas around the dome begin to be recognized, to force themselves into the picture. We see that the irregularity of their number is caused by the foreshortening of those on the further side making them appear in between the fixed four square lines of the others. There are four, like outlying sentries, guarding the marble platform, and four others rise from the platform 
from whence in its turn springs the dome then you glance at the exceeding beauty of the idea that has planned the effect of the cypress avenue the paved walks bordering the strip of water that all converge and lead the eye up to the shabutra or vast marble platform whereon stands the taj there are no steps in this platform no visible means of approach the three archways under the dome are recessed and in them the carving is so pure and delicate that even from this distance it looks like the carving on one of those ivory caskets from china the perfection of finish is astounding then even as we look the picture is enhanced by some specks of bright color which stream out of the shadow of the doorway some women with saris of peacock blue and sea green and salmon pink tender tints giving a flash of life and light to the silent and awing grandeur almost sternness i had said of the cold marble as you approach as you reach a middle distance the taj loses in effect but here the cruciform pavements meet and your attention is diverted to two red gateways at the ends amongst the trees thus you have behind you the great gateway on either hand these smaller ones complete the square whilst before you are the still unexplored mysteries of the taj as we emerge up through the opening on to the great shabutra blinded by the dazzling brightness of the sun on the marble which seems to collect and radiate every ray of sun about itself it is like the purity of driven snow on mountain heights as we stand under the semi-dome of the entrance in its relieving shadow we are conscious of a work almost too superhuman for humanity the frieze of marble is delicately carved in bas relief with lotus flowers each pistil and stamen of the flower each vein in every leaf being delineated with scrupulous exactness over this entrance leading into the abode of death is a sentence in arabic characters from the koran finishing up the verses of consolation with an invitation to the pure of heart to enter the garden of paradise we pass through the wrought cedar wood doors through the dim solemn light let in high up in the dome and struggling through the heavy marble trellis work we see the cenotaph the central romance that gave rise to this poem in marble the beautiful mumtaz mahal the exalted one of the palace was the wife of shah jahan then heir apparent to the throne the chosen wife of his youth the beloved one among all his harem she bore him seven children and died at the birth of the eighth when accompanying her husband on a campaign to the deccan against the tribe of lodi anguish stricken his grief found expression in a monument of purity after the eastern idea of beauty which considers as full dress a simple white robe with an aigrette of precious stones it has been truly said the taj is not a great national temple erected by a free and united people it owes its creation to the whim of an absolute ruler who was free to squander the resources of the state in commemorating his personal sorrows the cenotaph is surrounded by a screen of jolly and the entrance to it is just opposite to us within the screen she lies in the center the simpler and large tomb of the king has had to be placed at the side to the left so that that of the queen is the only one seen on entering shah jahan originally intended to build for himself a similar monument on the opposite bank of the jumna and to unite the two by a bridge he ended his reign in captivity and thus says mr taylor fate conceded to love what was denied to vanity these are the cenotaphs erected after the oriental manner for show the real tombs are in the vault below the screen is a network of geometrical combinations rare intricate and unique in the world all carved to the depth of two inches out of solid marble the open-work fringe of lace at the top has been added at a later date on this and on the walls around are what calls forth our most enthusiastic admiration our greatest expressions of delight the cenotaph the screen the walls are inlaid with flowers and designs in precious stones agates and colored marble 
Each leaf, each petal, each stalk is shaded by the different tones and colors of the stones. Each is perfect in the minute details of drawing, shading, and coloring. Every spray stands out from its marble background. Not a turn of a leaf, not the shade of a half-open calyx, but what is delicately indicated. Thirty separate pieces are used in every flower, and each spray has three of such. We see thus represented the lotus, the lily, and the iris. They are formed of precious stones, of cornelian, coral, lapis lazuli, bloodstone, jasper, garnets, turquoise, amethyst, crystal, sapphire, onyx, malachite, and agates. It is an Indian Petra Dura and differs from the Florentine only in that the latter is in bas relief. It took 17 years collecting the materials for the building of the Taj, and 20,000 workmen were employed in its construction for 23 years. It cost over 2 million pounds. Workmen came from all parts, from Turkey, Persia, Delhi, and the Punjab. The headmaster was Isa Muhammad, the illuminator was an inhabitant of Shiraz, and the master mason came from Baghdad. Many different countries were drawn upon for contributions of precious stones. The crystal came from China, cornelian from Baghdad, turquoises from Tibet, sapphires and lapis lazuli from Ceylon, coral from Arabia and the Red Sea, garnets from Bundelkund, plum pudding stone from Jasalmir, rock spar from Nirbuda, the onyx and amethyst from Persia, and there are many other stones used that we have no knowledge of nor name for in our language. A terrible old desperado was the Rajah of Bertpur, who caused many of the gems and precious stones to be picked out of the Taj. Government has replaced many of these and restored a whole corner which was removed by this regal robber. But though exactly the same when examined closely, the general effect looks coarse beside the original. The solemn light that glimmers down gives a holy, reverend look to this chamber of beauty and death, and the lotus frieze stands out grandly in the half-light. Up there the dome seems to lose itself in space, and looks intensely blue from deep shadows on the cold marble. Each of the octagon arches is crowned by a sentence from the Koran, and outside and inside the writing is so frequently repeated that it has often been declared that the whole of the Koran is thus inlaid in the Taj. Not the least beautiful and wonderful thing about the mausoleum is the echo that during 15 seconds lingers on the air, dying away as if with retreating steps down endless cloisters, dying so gently that you know not when it ceases. It is a finer echo than that in the baptistery at Pisa, which is thought to be the finest in Europe. The echo is so sharp and quick that only one note should be sounded, and this will be multiplied in the distance till you recognize not your own single tone. It is this that causes the discordant sound of voices speaking in the Taj, the echo repeating and mixing the different voices. I picture to myself the effect of an Arabic or Persian lament for the lovely Muntaz sung over her tomb. The responses that would come from above in the pauses of the song must resemble the harmonies of angels in paradise, writes one who has heard it. We descend into the vault by the long, sloping, marble-lined corridor. A sweet and sickly smell is wafted along it towards us. The subtle odor of otta of roses perfuming the air. Here is where the royal dust and ashes really rest, and it is very characteristic of the perfection and finish displayed throughout the Taj, that though unseen and in total darkness, the finish is just as elaborate, the walls, the cenotaph, the frieze of the purest marble, the mosaic of Pietra Dura as lovely and precious. The tomb of the queen is inscribed with the sentences of praise usual in Persian monuments, but that of the king bears a curious eulogium. The magnificent tomb of the king, inhabitant of the two paradises, the most sublime sitter on the throne of Ilyin, the starry heaven, dweller in Ferdos, paradise, Shah Jahan, Padishah Igaza, peace to his remains, 
heaven is for him his death took place on twenty-sixth day of rajab in the year ten seventy six of the hijri or sixteen sixty five a d from this transitory world eternity has marched him off to the next the two mosques that flank the platform are of red sandstone inlaid with marble and face east and west the western one only is used for prayer and the eastern one was built as a jawab or answer to the other showing how strong was the feeling for preserving the symmetry of the taj we wander round the platform which dwarfs everything with its immense size and makes us look like little black specks crossing its glistening surface and look over into the muddy waters of the jumna which washes the red sandstone platform of the taj on two sides in all distant views this platform spoils the effect of the taj appearing like a red brick wall on which the white dome alone is seen resting we look over the river to where higher up we see shining the temples and pavilions of the aram bagh or the garden of rest bishop heber truly expresses and sums up the glorious loveliness of the taj when he says it was designed by titans and finished by jewelers four times in all we visited the taj once again in the afternoon's light and shade and yet once more by moonlight but i still thought that nothing could exceed the beauty of that first glimpse through the red gateway the defects for what of human make is without appear more distinct each time one long absorbing visit to the taj is what i would recommend all the same by moonlight what you lose in detail you gain in the overwhelming solitude the solemnity of the scene the pure dome shows out against the dark blue vault of heaven the brilliancy of the silver-tipped turret towers eclipses the shining of the stars the taj looks then truly majestic you fear to break the silence by the echo of your footsteps as you steal quickly round in the deep shadows and come out on the dazzling platform in the glory of the full moon by the riverside at night you feel it is not a monumental palace but a burial place the smell of the tomb is close and vault-like and you shudder at the vast silence as you escape into the open once more one curious effect is then always remarked as you approach the taj by moonlight it seems to dwindle and recede and you only realize suddenly that you are near and almost under the platform in the afternoon we drove along a road which has been called the appian way of agra from the tombs and mausoleums which we see along the five-mile road to the village of secundra or secandria we are going to the mausoleum of the great akbar himself entering under a gateway which is a veritable study in red and white and other colored marbles we find ourselves in a small park the feeling of disappointment occasioned so often by the ruin and decay around these indian monuments is absent here for secundra delights us with a certain finish and completeness the trees bordering the broad paved causeway form as effective an avenue as the cypress at the taj to the pyramidal tomb at their end four grand causeways coming from four of these marble and sandstone gateways meet at the marble platform on which stands the mausoleum the idea of the mausoleum is peculiar and original as will be seen the semicircular dome of the entrance which is whitewashed forms an incongruity which mars the general effect of the facade down a dim gradually sloping passage we descend to the underground vault at its entrance by the pale light from the doorway we see the plain marble sarcophagus surmounted by a wreath of fresh flowers which contains the dust of akbar the founder of the great mogul empire the mightiest sovereign of a mighty race under the central dome it stands alone without name or inscription marking by its simplicity the chosen tomb of the great monarch we climb up one after another the four charbutras each one has the staircase unseen at first but discovered in a corner and which leads up to the trap hole through which we reappear onto the next platform thus each one you attain to seems to be the last we are looking down upon tiers of minarets 
and upon the four canopies pillar supported which face each way of the compass at length we climb the last flight and find ourselves at the summit on the white marble shabutra that crowns the whole all is of marble white and pure here surrounded by one of those exquisite filigree marble screens open to the heavens stand the whitest of sarcophagi hewn out of one single block of marble wrought and carved and fretted until it is like the carving of a sandalwood box the ninety-nine names of god in arabic are inscribed within and around the scrollwork of the tomb and it bears also the salutation of the faith allahu akbar jili julali hu the court is surrounded by a cloister with saracenic arches showing glimpses of the distant view tradition says that the sort of half pillar at the head of the tomb was intended for a setting for the Kohinoor diamond and that it really stood there for some time the first view of secundra brings dissatisfaction the creator of futapur sikri the builder of the fort and palace of agra the founder of the pearl mosque we look to see something more magnificent than this self-chosen resting place for by the subtle leading up and preparation we only realize the beauty of the summit when we look at that jointless tomb that court of purest marble its only canopy that of nature heaven's blue sky on the way home we paid a visit to the prison which is quite a special sight of india on account of the carpet manufacturers carried on there the prisoners sit before a screen or woof with the bobbins of colored worsted hanging in rows above each thread has to be tied separately into the string of the woof cut combed or pressed down and the scissors and combs used are of the rudest order a reader chants or sings songs out the colors of the pattern at intervals saying so many white threads so many red or blue and the ground is filled in afterwards from fifteen to twenty men are squatted on the bench at work on the same carpet and an inch and a half is the usual daily advance the blending of colors and designs of these carpets are very rich and handsome and the borders especially fine this prison is the principal one in india and their carpets are much sought after they are sold to the magasin du louvre and the bon marche at paris and supplied also to a bond street firm one that we saw in progress was an order from the duke of connaught for a present to the queen and another is being made for the empress eugenie there are only three european warders in this prison and nearly all the remainder are good conduct prisoners one who accompanied us holding a huge umbrella over my head had thrown a man down a well in a fit of temper in the cookhouse we saw them busy making thousands of chapatis or flat cakes of coarse meal the only food they require the difficulty of caste is got over here by the brahmins or highest caste being alone employed for the cooking we bought some very pretty ornaments today made of soapstone a clay of a warm gray tint and which forms beautifully clean raised patterns on boxes and card trays etc monday january twenty sixth we began our morning with a disappointment we had intended to drive out twenty three miles to futapur sikri to see the village of palaces and princely buildings of akbar's first metropolis abandoned for the fort at agra on account of its unhealthiness but we were confronted with the tiresome detail of not having given notice the previous day for relays of horses along the road hoping perhaps to return to agra we determined to leave for delhi by the midday train in going to the station we saw a touching sight a bier covered with flowers was set on the ground and a little group were squatted resignedly around mute not weeping but looking helplessly and steadfastly at the bier the chief mourner had taken his place at the head and this is the sight you often see as you pass down some quiet avenue or near approach to the river banks a mournful little party a few bearers carrying the bier uplifted and hurrying down towards the sacred river with their burden crying as they pass along that mournful wail the name of god is true if you speak true it will bring salvation eight hours journey brought us in the evening to delhi we found the northbrook so full of americans 
for we meet such numbers of them traveling in India, come across from Frisco to Japan and China, and taking India on their way to Europe, generally bent on arriving to Rome for Easter week. So we took refuge at the United Service Hotel. Here there is the officious, though, be it said, intelligent guide, Babu Das, well known to travelers at Delhi. A word about the hotels. An Indian hotel is the embodiment of dirt and discomfort. There is nothing to complain of in the food, but the rooms are damp and cellar-like, with whitewashed walls and the barest amount of furniture. Dressing is a lengthy process when you have to divide your toilette between a brick-floored bathroom and a dressing room with one looking glass and a chair and a bedroom equally dismal. Moreover, they are built solely with regard to the heat, and in the cold nights and frosty mornings you suffer bitterly from the draft of air traps from skylights in the roof and doors and windows that refuse and are never intended to close tightly. Added to this are the multitude of servants from whose incessant attention you suffer much annoyance, no one man doing the same thing. On leaving a hotel, a crowd of at least six are awaiting bakshish, the kit mugar, the sirdar, the beastie, the sweeper, etc. No exception can be made for any one hotel. We found them all equally atrocious, even including those of Bombay and Calcutta. End of section 37. Chapter 28 of 40,000 Miles Over Land and Water. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Jennifer Painter. 40,000 Miles Over Land and Water by Ethel Gwendolyn Vincent. Cities of the Great Mogul, Part 3. Tuesday, January the 27th. We drove along the mall of the civil lines, where was lying the encampment of a collector or other provincial officer, travelling on his annual round of inspection. We passed under the battered portals of the Kashmir Gate, so famed for its noble defence during the mutiny. Just on the other side of this is Skinner's Church. Colonel Skinner married first, as was natural, an Englishwoman and built this church. But secondly, he married a Mohammedan, and then the mosque opposite was built. But last of all, he espoused a Hindu, when the Hindu temple, a little way off, came into existence. He used to say that when he died, he would be sure of going to the heaven of the best religion. Delhi has a fort containing a palace, a diwas e kaz a diwas e am a pearl mosque and a jama mujid, similar and in the same position as at Agra. But all, with the exception of the mosque, are but a feeble reproduction of the latter. Shah Jahan, as we know, founded Delhi, but the works he accomplished were but a feeble and poor imitation of those of his noble grandfather Akbar at Agra. The four splendid gateways of the fort, with their grand red colouring and coping of domes, would appear to be copied from the gateway of the Taj. We entered by the Lahore Gate and passed under the vaulted causeway known as the Chattas, or Umbrella of the King, and where the military bazaar now maintains a certain air of picturesqueness. The Diwan e Am, the Hall of Public Audience, is the usual marble loggia. It has only a cumbrous canopy of marble over the marble throne, but the wall behind is most beautifully inlaid with mosaic. The colours are still extraordinarily bright and show the green plumage of the parakeets, the blue of the hummingbirds, while groups of flowers and clusters of fruit complete a rare panel of beauty. The Dewan i Kaz, or Hall of Private Audience, is at present disfigured by trusses of hay wrapped round the inlaid pillars whilst the work of reparation is being carried on. Government proposes to spend three lakhs of rupees in restoring the original marvels that existed of gold and silver filigree work, 
the pillars having been plated with sheets of gold and the ceiling covered with silver. It is estimated that this ceiling, which was part of the spoil of the Mahratta invasion of 1759, produced a hundred and seventy thousand pounds worth of silver. The inscription in the corner of the ceiling is the well-known and very beautiful, If there is a paradise on earth, it is here, it is here, it is here. The famous peacock throne was in this hall. The throne was six feet long and four feet broad, composed of solid gold inlaid with precious gems. The back was formed of jewelled representations of peacock's tails. It was surmounted by a gold canopy on twelve pillars of the same material. Around the canopy hung a fringe of pearls, and on each side of the throne stood two chattas, or umbrellas, the symbol of royalty. They were formed of crimson velvet, richly embroidered with gold thread and pearls, and had handles, eight feet long, of solid gold studded with diamonds. This unparalleled achievement of the jeweller's art was constructed by a Frenchman, Austin de Bordeaux. The value of the throne is estimated by Tavernier, himself a professional jeweller, at six million pounds sterling. The peacock throne was taken away by the Persian, Nadir Shah. Then we were taken to the palace and into a little room, three-cornered in shape and with its windows open towards the river. Inlaid in mosaic there is here the sweet little inscription. Sigh not, for good times are at hand. The scales of justice are represented in another place in inlaid marbles over the trellis door, which leads into the Zenana. Here every care has been lavished upon the beauty of the decoration of the various rooms, though the red and green flowers and running patterns look coarse and gorgeous to our eyes, so lately accustomed to the delicacy and minuteness of the Agra Pietra Dura. Here again we see how Shah Jahan failed to produce the minute beauty of Akbar's palace. Still, the colour is interesting for being so well preserved, showing out as if it was finished but yesterday, and one is glad to see that any attempt was made to lighten the prison house and the dull lives of its inmates. The bathrooms, as in all eastern palaces, are the great feature and occupy the largest portion of this palace. Running round the centre room there is a shallow channel inlaid with an ingenious serpenting pattern in black, and the water coursing swiftly over this produces the effect of fishes swimming about in the water. In other rooms we see the children's smaller baths and the shower bath formed by a fountain springing up through the floor. The centre hall contains a pool inlaid with jade. It was here the ladies came to drink after the bath, and the water filtering through the holes of jade was supposed to be purified and cooled by it. This was an old eastern idea, for we are told that kings always had their drinking cups of jade. The bath in the king's apartments had hot and cold water laid on, and was used by the Prince of Wales when on his visit to Delhi. The Pearl Mosque is an almost perfect model in miniature proportions of the Moti Mujid of Agra, but this one was kept only for the use of the king and his family. The paving of this court is very pretty, the squares being indicated by double black lines, and those under the mosque are fringed at the top with three delicate sprays of jasmine flowers. The remainder of the fort is occupied by the barracks of our troops. Passing out between the formidable spikes of the Delhi Gate, we drive up before the Jama Musjid, the finest mosque in India. It is called Jama, or the Friday Mosque, because Friday is the sacred day of the week according to the Muslim religion. Escaping two albino beggars, most repulsive objects, we ascend up the magnificent flight of broad, shallow steps, those steps which on three sides form such a splendid approach to the imposing grandeur within. The wooden gates at the entrance are interesting on account of their immense thickness and their age, which is over 200 years. When inside the court we see that it is entirely paved with white marble, with black lines, 
which has a very striking effect when extended over such a vast space. In the centre there is the usual marble reservoir, where some Mohammedans are washing their feet preparatory to praying. Three cupolas of white marble, crowned by gilded coulisses, rise over the red arches, and pillars that form the open loggia of the mosque. The centre cupola is partly hidden by the great square of the principal entrance in which the pointed Gothic arc is splendidly described. The cornices of this pointed archway are divided into ten compartments, each ten feet broad, which contain inscriptions in black marble on a white ground. Following the usual construction, the two minarets that flank the mosque seem almost of an exaggerated height. They are inlaid with the white and red marble stripes placed vertically, and are, as always, the pride and beauty of the city. For miles around, their graceful proportions can be seen isolated, reaching towards the sky, when all other parts of the city are unseen. A colonnade of red sandstone surrounds the court, and the whole beauty of the mosque lies in the splendid contrast of the red rich sandstone against the white marble court. To enhance the scene here are a long row of worshippers, bending and rising in unison, saluting the earth and crying out with one voice in response to the priest who is under the portico, and other barefooted worshippers are hurrying from the tank after performing their ablutions to join them. On every Friday some 10,000 souls cover the court of the Friday mosque. The tack, or niche of the Qibla, is beautifully carved, and the pulpit, consisting of three panels, is hewn out of one splendid block of marble. It is from here that the priest gives the well-known salutation of the faith, Allah, Allah, and the response comes intoned back from the multitude, Jili Julali. In a corner of the court they opened a casket of relics for us to see, a parchment written by Hussein and Hassein, the grandsons of Mahomet, a shoe of the Prophet, his footprint on a stone, left while healing the sick, and lastly, most precious of all, a single hair from his beard. Mahomet must have had a very red beard. The beggars of Delhi are a proverbial for their importunity, and on the steps of the mosque they glean a rich harvest. The maimed, the halt, the blind, pursued us till we were fain to take refuge in the carriage from the armless stumps, the twisted and distorted limbs that were thrust forward to excite our pity. Not less troublesome are the hawkers and vendors, who swarm everywhere in the verandas of the hotels, but nowhere worse than at Delhi. They leave you no peace, pursue you everywhere, and even insinuate themselves in at your bedroom door. They are the pest of Indian travellers. Driving in the afternoon through the Queen's Gardens, the abode of the horrid yellow pariah dogs of the city, we reached the outskirts of the town and came to the old fort made five hundred years old. It consists of some ruined walls, so massive that, judging from the aperture of the loopholes, they must have been at least eleven feet thick. On the top of a large pile of ruins, nobly placed, stands the lat, or staff of Feroz Shah, another of Asukar's columns. It is like those we have seen at Benares and Alalabad, only this one is of more ancient date, being 2,200 years old. The lat is a single shaft of sandstone, tapering very slightly towards the top. The inscription in Pali, the oldest language in India, is almost illegible, but it consists of Certain edicts for the furtherance of religion and virtue, enacted by a king called Duma Asoka Piyadasi, who must have changed his character after ascending the throne, which he only reached by the murder of the ninety relations who had prior claims. A kite perched on its broken summit, looking curiously monumental, and there were others sitting in solemn rows on the ruins around, with heads turned towards the commissariat building below, whence they were expecting their daily meal of refuse. Others were also swooping around the river banks, waiting for one of the dead bodies, 
which are so frequently seen floating down the Jumna. We returned to the town and found our way through a very slummy lane to a beautiful little gem, a giant temple, most exquisitely carved outside, though this was almost hidden and lost in the narrow street and the shadow of the overhanging houses. We passed the passage leading round to the further side of the temple, where the women worship apart from the men. Lately we have been seeing many mosques and temples with cupolas, domes, and minarets of all sizes and forms. But now we see one of a totally different design. There is a kind of cupola with a gilded top, but it is a very squat one, and the effect produced is as by a cushion crushed down by the weight of a crown. The idol, with legs doubled under him, is sitting cross-legged under the canopy inlaid with gold leaf. Jayan, the god, was naked, and in this he differs from the Hindu gods, who are always represented clothed. This used to give rise to serious riots on the day in the year when Jayan was paraded through the streets in procession, the Hindus pelting him with mud, and a free fight generally ensuing between the different followers. A military force is brought out now on this day of the year for the protection of Jayan at the expense of his believers. The Hindus also parade their god Ganesh once a year on June the 17th, and we went to see the juggernaut car used on this occasion and kept in a stable adjoining the Jama Mosque. The car is entirely covered with gold leaf and cost, it is said, £25,000. We noticed particularly the re several railings which surrounded the seat of the god, placed there by the priests to catch the money thrown to him in the streets. It is drawn by four prize bullocks, who have been previously fattened on an allowance of from four to five pounds of melted butter daily, conveyed to them through the trough of a hollow stick. On our way home, we drove through the Chandi Chowk. It is the finest native bazaar in India, the street being a mile long and so broad that there is room for four avenues with two roads and three pavements. In the Chowk, there is the Kot Valley and the little mosque perched up among the roofs of the houses where Nadia Shah sat and ordered the massacre in which he killed a hundred thousand people. Midway, the street is intersected, and the harmony of the quaint old houses, with their overhanging wooden balconies, much disturbed by the modern red building of the Delhi Museum and Institute, and by the Gothic clock tower immediately opposite. It was in the Chandi Chok that we bought some of those lovely embroideries in gold and silver thread on satin and velvet, for which Delhi is justly celebrated. We saw also some very valuable Kashmir shawls, one being valued at 4,000 rupees. Wednesday, January the 28th. A tremendous thunderstorm with hailstones as large as beans kept us awake during part of the night. The lightning shone in from the little windows high up in the wall and was the most vivid I have ever seen. When morning came, we thought the weather was going to fail us for the first time since we have been in India, so violent was the downpour of rain. But by eleven it cleared, and we were able to start with a fine sky for our eleven miles drive to the Kutub Column. There are a multitude of things to be seen on the way, and it would be hard to surpass in interest the drives about Delhi. Endless are the antiquarian remains that are scattered about the plain for miles around. They are all ruins of old Delhis, for nine separate cities have at different times been built and abandoned within a radius of twenty miles of the present one. Thus, as you drive along, the ruin of an old fort or the remains of a city wall are pointed out to you as Delhi number four or Delhi number eight. Our driver chose that we should not stop, as is customary, outside the grand fort of the old Delhi, the most ancient of all the ruins, and see the mosque inside the octagonal library where the Emperor Humayun met his death by falling down the stairs of the tower. A mile further on we come to the tomb of the Emperor, 
a splendid mausoleum standing in a garden. It is rendered so imposing from the huge chabutra of red sandstone on which it stands, open to the surrounding country. In the centre of the circular room under the dome is the plain sarcophagus of the emperor, the father of Akbar. As usual, the surrounding rooms forming the corners of the circular room are full of the tombs of the wives, sons and daughters of the great man, and in one corner, side by side, are the tombs of five mullahs. The trellis work is shown of one of the windows where it was broken by Captain Hodgson on the capture of the King of Delhi in 1857. The King had taken refuge in the corner pointed out behind a bronze door, and the window was broken as being an easier access. A bright blue enamel dome near here is supposed to have been the residence of the Begum's bangle cellar, and a brick one adjoining that of the royal barber. This might have been the case, for these eastern mausoleums were often used as palaces, previous to the death of the person by whom they were built. Then we drove on to a spot which is literally a village of the dead, so closely serried are the marble sarcophagi, and where little courts and mosques and mausoleums are visible in all directions. Our chief wish in coming here was to see the grave of Jehanara Begum, the eldest daughter of Shah Jahan, whose story is so simple and touching. She became a religieuse very young, and declared her intention of never marrying. On her father's disgrace, Jehanara shared his prison and captivity. She is buried here, and her grave is a plain grass one, and the inscription at its head, dictated by herself, tells us the reason. It says, Let no rich canopy cover my grave. This grass is the best covering for the tomb of the poor spirit. The humble, the transitory Jehanara, the disciple of the sects of the Chistis, the daughter of the Emperor Shah Jahan. Here also Prince Jenangir, a son of Akbar II, is buried, who was exiled by the English government on account of his frequent attempts to murder his brother, and who is said to have died from his excessive love of cherry brandy. He was the favourite son of the Emperor, who always believed that he died of sighing. The celebrated Persian poet Amir Khusran lies nearby, and these, with many other tombs, are surrounded by that exquisite marble trellis work that forms the most beautiful feature of Mussulman architecture. These tombs lie around or in a small marble court of great purity, from the centre of which rises a tiny dome of marble, whose octagonal angles are marked with black lines. An open colonnade, with satasenic arches richly carved, show us the tomb of that most sacred Mohammedan saint, Nizam ud Din, within, whose sanctity still draws bands of pilgrims to his tomb. The wooden canopy of the tomb is inlaid with exquisite mother of pearl, that in the dim light looked iridescent, with opal tints of blue and green and purple. A row of ostrich eggs were hung around, and a Koran stood open at his head. The mosque, 600 years old, and very quaintly carved, completes this little world, where so much of interest lies gathered into such small compass. The Chazat Kumba is nearby, the 64-pillared hall, as it is called, which number is only made up by the cunning device of counting the four sides to each of the square pillars. Returning, we look into a baoli, or well, a deep tank walled in all round, containing green and slimy water. The crowd of natives who always accompany the Ferengis, Europeans, point upwards, and on the summit of the kiosk of a mosque, forty feet above us, we see a man who, as we look, takes a run and a header into the water. It seems quite a minute that we watch him falling through the air with his legs wide apart, bringing them quickly together, just as he plumps into the water with such thudding force that you think he must be crushed or cracked by the volition of his own weight. He is up in a moment. The tank being very deep, the diver only goes a few feet down and does not reach the bottom. 
Then he comes up the steps, shivering and with teeth chattering for his bakshish. On account of the height of the surrounding buildings, the sun never reaches this tank for more than three or four hours each day, and the water is intensely cold. And now we have a drive of some four or five miles before us. The ruins cluster thickly about the country here, and we see many of the small mosques which mark the site of a Mohammedan cemetery, with their old gravestones and white pillars, which show, they say, the spot of a sati over the grave. A tremendous storm overtook us before we reached the dark bungalow, where we were to have tiffin. We went at once to the Kutub Minar, or pillar, the loftiest column in the world, or 234 feet high. But its chief interest is not derived from this, but from its extreme beauty and unique character. Pillars and columns there are all over the world, from the Pillars of Hercules to the monument near London Bridge, but none so beautiful, so original, so rich as the Kutub Minar of Delhi. In the first place, it is built of full-coloured red sandstone, and in the second, it is fluted. But the fluting does not convey the curious and effective pattern, seen nowhere else, I think, of a fluting alternately round and angular. The Kutub tapers, as all such mighty erections must, that the laws of equilibrium may be carried out in their broad base. It is divided into five stories by the balconies which run round in a zigzag and which are supported by a bracket where each angle touches the column. But the distance between these balconies diminishes in proportion to the diameter of the shaft, thus adding to the apparent height of the column by exaggerated perspective. The first story, or the ground floor, is polygonal, with the fluting in alternate rows of acute angles and rounded semicircles. The second is entirely semicircle. The third, all acute angles. The fourth is a circle of white marble, a curious anomaly. And the fifth is just a band of carving, surmounted by the railed enclosure of the summit. These alternate flutings give an irregular appearance to the horizontal lines of the pillar when seen at a little distance off, and the base also appears to bulge out much at the sides where it enters the ground. Maintaining the idea of the symmetry of the gradually ascending but decreasing scale, all the delicate Arabic inscriptions, the bands of the Koran surrounding the Minar are arranged as follows. Six are on the lowest, two are on the second, and one on the third story, but none above on the next, where the marble band replaces them. The top band on the lower story gives the ninety-nine names of God in Arabic, and the remainder are variously verses from the Koran or praises of Mulhabid bin Sam. Twice the Qutub has been struck by lightning, once in 10,068 and again in 1503, as recorded in an inscription. But now it is made safe from such damages by the lightning rod, which we see at the bottom, and meet again at the top of the 375 steps. Some idea is given of its narrowing proportions, when I say that three men can easily stand abreast on the lower steps, whereas here at the summit one man can with difficulty pass. The view over the plain of Delhi in its utter flatness reaching even to the horizon, is very uninteresting and disappointing on account of the weary toil up. The Hindus claim the Kutub as of their erection and say it was made by Prithi Raj to enable his daughter to see over the plains to the sacred Ganges. Other think it is Mohammedan and certainly the inscriptions must have been added by them. Looking up to the Kutub, we noticed a curious effect that the clouds moving quickly across the sky gave to the tower the appearance of shifting instead. Near the Kutub Minar is a similar column, commenced to match the other, but left unfinished, it is now falling into decay. As usual, minor antiquities cluster round the greater one, and near the Kutub is the tomb of the Emperor Altinash, the supposed builder of the column, and the palace of the Emperor Alauddin which has a very beautiful horseshoe arch. 
This is considered the first specimen of Patan architecture extant. But the principal interest here is a mosque constructed from the remains of 27 Hindu temples by the first Mohammedan king of Delhi in 1193. The Hindu columns that have been used by their successors to form the thick row of cloisters are most admirably and quaintly carved. Gods and mythological features form the chief feature, but in one corner we see a bullock cart, where the tyre and spokes of the wheel are very distinct. In another some men pounding millet, while monkeys form the brackets, or the head of a bull the ornamentation for a capital. In the centre of this ruined temple stands the iron pillar of the famous legend. It rises 22 feet above the ground, and it has been proved by excavation that its foundation is at least 62 feet below the surface. Raja Pithora consulted the Brahmins, or priests, as to the length of his dynasty. They replied that if he could sink an iron shaft into the earth, and pierce the snake god Lishe, who upheld the earth, it would endure for ever. Time elapsed, and the Raja became curious to know the result of the sinking of his iron shaft, and against all Brahminical warnings had the pillar uprooted. Great was the consternation when it was found that the end was covered with blood. It was hastily put back again into the earth, but the charm was broken. The kingdom of Pithora was shortly conquered, his life taken, and no Hindu king has ever reigned in Delhi since. It was a pretty sight to see the sacred goats living above the temple, looking down over the ruined wall on a caravan of camels, whose drivers had gone up the tower, when some took the opportunity for saying their prayers. When they came down again, I suddenly thought what a good opportunity this would be to try riding on a camel. Seated on the edge and hindermost point of his back, it was an awful moment when the camel sat forward on his front knees and then rose to the full length of his forelegs. Then I was at a very acute and ticklish angle, and he took his time, too, to raise his hind legs and bring me to a comfortable level once more. The motion is easy and pleasant, though it makes your head waggle in a ridiculous way when taken at the slow, deliberate walk that the driver carefully led me. But I can well imagine the agony of the trot, when no action of your body can keep time or swing with such an incomprehensible motion. The worst part, undoubtedly, is the getting off. Down goes the first division of the animal, the legs to the knees, and then the second, at which the body rests on the ground, when you are in danger of being precipitated over his head. Lastly, the hind legs subside, and you slide off over his tail. At the word of command, he performs these various evolutions, but it is generally accompanied by a discontented snort and grunt. I like the deliberate way the beast always walks, with that affected turning of the head from side to side, and the nose disdainfully held high in the air. And in returning home, we passed the beautiful white dome of the mausoleum of Sajjar Jiang. But though beautiful outside, there is nothing to see in the interior, and we were fairly weary of mosques, mausoleums, and tombs today. Nor did we linger at the Junta Mundia, or observatory, as we had seen that finer one of Benares. From the distance, we traced its gigantic sundial, and the two towers exactly alike, with the pillars that mark the 360 degrees, so that one observation could be corrected by the other. Needless to say that we were extremely tired at nightfall. Thursday, January the 29th, we drove up onto the ridge, seeing Ludlow Castle of mutiny fame, in front of which was stationed Battery No. 2, which was to open the main breach by which the city was stormed. Here also is the Flagstaff Tower, to which the ladies of the station were first taken when the hope of speedy relief from Meerut was yet with them. It is a fitting and commanding situation for the red brick monument erected to the British and native troops who died in action of wounds or of disease during the mutiny by their comrades who lament their loss and the government they served so well. 
The ridge is also celebrated for a well-known Pacific measure of our times, for it saw the great Durbar of the 1st of January, 1877, when the Queen was proclaimed Empress of India. It and the surrounding plain presented a marvellous sight, covered with the tents of Rajas and Maharajas, and of the thousands gathered there, forming the largest camp that had ever been seen. We left Delhi that morning. In the afternoon, we had a very interesting meeting at Ghaziabad with Syed Ahmed Khan, CSI, the founder and honorary secretary of the Mohammedan Oriental College, and who is looked up to by all the Mohammedans of India as their intellectual head. He came thus far to meet us, and travelled back with us to Aligur, where the college is situated, as being most central for all parts of India. This allowed C having two hours' conversation with him, and learning much about the great Mohammedan community of India. We reached Agra late that evening, about ten o'clock, when we made our visit to the Taj by moonlight. End of section 38「Chapter 19, Part 1 of 40,000 Miles Over Land and Water」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 40,000 Miles Over Land and Water by Ethel Gwendolyn Vincent Gwalior and Rajputana, Part 1 Friday, January 30th. Left Agra at 7.30 on our way to Gwalior. After crossing the Chumbla on one of the finest bridges in India, we came to a very strange bit of country. Every foot of the bare ground was gulched, upturned, upheaved into conical mounds. We saw a quantity of curious little sugar loaf cones, apparently of natural origin, and the whole represents a series of miniature valleys and mountains. This broken ground alone would form a formidable obstacle to the enemy's approach to Gwalior without its celebrated fort. Long before we reached Gwalior, we saw the great bridge of rock some two miles in length, though only one in width, which rises up out of the plain. It is the Gibraltar of India, and standing out of the plain instead of out of the sea, was called, before modern cannon brought the fort within range of neighboring heights, the key of Hindustan. It is a great rampart of nature, and the range of fortress walls which crown the summit well become the site. They frown down upon the palace of Cynthia himself, lying immediately underneath in mockery guarding his territory. For though the Maharaja's standard floats from the flagstaff, British soldiers occupy the stronghold. Sir Lepel Griffin, the Governor-General's agent to the Princes of Central India, was on his annual tour and in camp at Morar, the adjacent military station. He had asked us to stay with him at Indor, Holkar's capital, where he is permanently located, and now offered us the hospitality of his camp but all our ideas of having to rough it melted before the oriental luxury of the temporary town we drove through a neat street of tents and were set down before a handsome pavilion this was the entrance hall with visitors book and where the scarlet-clad chuparasis are in constant attendance through this we passed into a drawing-room lined with brocade thickly carpeted rugs, full of easy chairs and of tables covered with photographs, books, newspapers, flowers, etc. An anteroom, again, leads into the dining room. The tents for the remainder of the party are ranged on either side of the pavilion. Here we are in far greater luxury than in any Indian hotel, and save for the supporting pole in the centre and the pebbles crunching under the carpet, we might think ourselves in a comfortable room. All around there are the cheerful sounds of camp life, the chattering of servants, the stamping of picketed horses, or the whistling proceeding from your opposite neighbor's tent. 
Some officers of the regiment are playing polo in the adjoining ground, and their horses' feet resound as they scamper about on the hard earth. All commissioners and collectors he have to camp out for one or two months in the year on their tours of inspection, and so it comes to be quite a feature of Indian life. The rule, then, is for one set of tents to be set on in advance overnight. The revere is sounded at 5 a.m. or some such early hour, and the ten miles march is accomplished before the heat of the day and they sit down to breakfast on the new camping ground with the tents ready pitched not the least wonderful part of the camp is the kitchen everything is cooked out in the open and there is but one tent for the culinary department there are one or two mud ovens and holes in the ground filled with charcoal and with this and a very few pots and pans a native cook manages to turn out a most elegant dinner for eighteen rarely if ever are the dishes or sauces smoked even when a contrary wind is blowing we went to a small tennis party in the evening and returned home along the mall sir lepo stopped and took us into the club where there is one room set aside for the use of the ladies it is a popular institution and prevails at many of the stations the ladies walk down here in the evening before dinner and have a gossip or read the papers whilst their husbands are playing billiards in an adjoining room this reminds me also of another but very different kind of club the mutton club which exists at most stations there are few butchers in india as none are called for among the hindu population so the ladies on a station frequently join together and keep their own flock of sheep and a shepherd which supplies them with meat twice a week and they take it in turns for the prime joints some energetic member of the community keeps the accounts and collects the subscriptions there was a dinner party in the evening and during dinner the band of native infantry regiment the duke of connaught's own played outside the tent and afterwards conjurers performed some well-known indian tricks it strikes you as curious at first when you step out of your tent into the moonlight in full evening dress and walk across the pavilion to dinner to see the guests arriving up the street which looks so pretty with its row of lamps saturday january thirty first in camp at Gwelior, awoke at seven a m to the merry noises of an awakening camp bugles braying horses neighing a band playing in the distance soldiers parading on the plain near by under their officers shouts of command and gongs sounding at intervals from all sides it was very chilly work turning out for in the early morning and late at night the cold in the tents is intense at eight o'clock we started muffled up in winter wraps yet shivering much and drove to the bottom of the gwalior hill here we found one of the Majoraha's elephants waiting to take us up the very steep climb to the fort, which is impossible to ascend in a carriage. Those who have been on an elephant know well the first sensation of fright that comes with the acute angle as the beast raises himself on his hind legs, when his forelegs bring us to a level, and then we seem to be on a height which is dwarfing to all below us the motion is a painful uneven one to which you never seem able to find a corresponding one for your body and the howdah becomes anything but a comfortable seat however pleased you may be at first with the novelty of the situation i think the mahout with his two-pronged fork sitting astride the elephant's neck and guiding him by the pressure of his knees under the flopping ears has the more comfortable position of the two the little fairy, as the elephant was poetically and inappropriately termed, was very slow, and our progress proportionally tedious. Our party must have presented a very picturesque appearance, as perched aloft on the red and yellow trappings of the howdah, our bell sounding out melodiously with the swaying walk of the elephant, we wound up under the walls of the old fort. 
the strength of the position is marvellous and we do not wonder that the chiefs of india would hardly believe when told that it had fallen into our hands a little more than a century ago we passed through two gateways and then were beneath the castellated walls where under the protection of each battlement is a row of glazed tiles of bright colours in blue and green one wonders how the decoration so strangely out of place ever came there and in other parts of the fort it appears again in one place yellow geese are represented by these means walking in single file along the length of a wall the whole of this narrow ridge is taken up with cantonments and barracks laid in parallel lines on its perfectly flat surface it is so narrow that passing along the road in the centre you can almost see down on to the plain immediately below on either hand one beautiful bit of antiquity still remains inside the fort in a wonderful hindu temple surrounded by a museum of ancient outdoor monuments stowed mummies jain idols and monstrosities of hydra-headed beasts looking at each other from over a pillar the temple is very high square and narrow a peculiar kind of formation and unlike most hindu temples which taper towards the top it is built of small stones which seem to form gothic arches in out-of-the-way corners and the whole temple presents an intricate mass of irregularities to finish all it is covered in at the top by a modern addition a huge white stone semicircular roof ending squarely and looking entirely like a huge sarcophagus as we passed the parade ground we saw the general reviewing a body of troops the tramp of their feet and their regular lines with bayonets gleaming in the morning sun was a cheerful sight the views from the fort are magnificent there is old Gwalior lying away among its sprinkling of trees, with the open space where the large square of buildings shows the Maharaja's palace and gardens. The mud huts of the large village of Lashkar, the city proper of Gwalior, is at our feet, and away to the left is the defile of the Urwai Gorge, whose summit, on a level with the fort, is the only weak point in the defences we had breakfast on returning at eleven o'clock a very usual hour when chota hazri supplies all earlier wants and from twelve p m a string of callers were coming and going the indian etiquette requires calls to be paid between the hottest hours of the day from twelve till two p m a combat of animals had been organized for that afternoon for us the natives squatting round formed a bright ring of colour and somewhat against our will we were obliged to witness a typical indian entertainment some cocks were the first to appear on the arena but save one couple were not at all game then some little partridges were brought loudly calling challenges to each other from their wicker cages but when brought face to face they only showed us a succession of clever dodgings they were followed by a pair of bulbuls those fluffy-headed bullfinches whom we hear chirping in the trees in the evening with such a deafening noise but the rams showed the best fight let fly from opposite ends of the circle they met in the centre with tremendous force the repeated dull thud of their horns echoing for days after in our ears provided that they meet with their heads well down it is their horns that have the full force of the concussion and it does not hurt them a white ram was produced which was held back with difficulty springing and showing fight to all the rams that came near him he proved too strong and heavy for all the others and they fled in terror before him and could hardly be persuaded to meet him then he would take a mean advantage of their retreat and go after them butting at their backs and sides and turning them contemptuously over we saw a snake pitted against a mongoose but curiously enough little fury as the mongoose is he refused to touch the very handsome spotted snake and retreated at every hiss the second and smaller one however he succeeded in apparently killing flattening his neck till blood poured out of his mouth 
This was the signal for a wonderful exhibition. The man declared he could bring the snake to life again, and, making a hole in the earth, he laid the head in and poured water on it. The effect was magical. The neck stiffened and moved, and gradually the serpent reared its head. Then the cure was completed by the sweet dirge-like music charming the snake and making it wave its head in time, intently following each undulation, unconscious of all save the magic music. A buffalo fight was tried in another part of the camp, but it was evident that they, in common with the other animals, had no natural animosity for one another. Later in the afternoon, we went to the cantonment to see some tent-pegging by the 4th Bengal Native Cavalry. This was a very different kind of tent-pegging to any performance of the kind you would see at the Agricultural Hall at Islington. Here the men were on a large open space and flew by at full speed with a wild rush, balancing the long spear low and carrying off the tiny peg, almost lost in such a space, by piercing it through. The dress of the native cavalry is splendid, scarlet coats, or more crimson perhaps, with blue and white striped turbans, while that of the infantry is buff with dark blue turbans and facings. We walked through the cavalry lines of horse pickets, and the horses of this regiment are exceptionally fine, either country-bred or Australians. Each man is obliged to keep a grass-cutter for his horse, and a pony or mule is shared by two, which goes out early in the morning and returns to camp at night with the next day's load of grass. We drove home through the bazaar, which is considered almost the model bazaar of India. It is hardly credible what order and brightness by whitewashing and a uniformity of red-striped blinds has been introduced by the encouragement of Brigadier General Massey of Crimean fame when he commanded here. A great deal of the native carved woodwork has been used with great effect in balconies and over gateways, particularly in that of the Serai, or the house of hospitality for native travellers, which you find in all villages. We drove out to dinner by moonlight that evening in an open carriage, the usual way at Mofussil stations, where a close carriage is so rarely wanted. The word Mofussil sounded so funny to me at first, but it is very expressive of the station and up-country life of India. Sunday, February 1st to church in the morning, the scarlet of the infantry and the nave and the blue of the artillery lining the transepts made a very effective addition to the congregation. The choir was formed of soldiers and accompanied by a brass band. Captain Robertson, first assistant to the agent, showed us today a carita, or a letter to a native prince. The paper is specially made for this purpose and is sprinkled with gold leaf. Only the last few lines of the somewhat lengthy document contain the purport of the letter, while the remainder is made up of the usual roundabout and complimentary phrases. It is folded in a peculiar way, with the flaps outwards and inserted into a muslin bag, and this latter into one of crimson and gold tint, with a slipknot of gold thread, attached to which is a ponderous seal. The superscription and address on a slip of paper is passed into the bag between this latter and the muslin one. I have given these details in full because they are important to Indian epistolary art, as, should any of them be admitted, it would be thought an insult had been offered to the person addressed. It may not be generally known that the native states still extant in India are 800, the out of them only two hundred are of any importance. The Nizam of Hyderabad, the Maharajas of Sindhai and Holkar, each have an income of over a million sterling a year, and the kingdom of that first named is as large as Italy. This gives us some idea of the importance and power which still remains in the hands of the native princes added to which many of them maintain their own army, consisting of several regiments. This is the Maharaja Sindhai's great pride, the strength, 
and efficacy of his army, and we were so sorry to have come a few days too late to see the review which he had just held when he commanded his troops in person, and also to have missed the Durbar where his highness was received in state by Sir Lapel. Since then he has been laid up with fever, and we were, therefore, unable to see him or his palace, which contains one of the finest Durbar halls in India. We left the camp at daybreak the next morning, and this will ever be remembered as the coldest and most disagreeable of our many early morning starts, collecting our things and leaving as we did in the dark. We returned to Agra for the third and last time, where we spent the night. Again, all the next day we were traveling on the Rajputana State Railway to Jaipur, which we reached at six in the evening. The country around Jaipur is of that peculiar formation which presents a flat plain of untold limits, interrupted at frequent intervals by conical-shaped hills that often attain to the height of mountains. Surrounded by a semicircle of these mountains, lying in the hollow of their midst, is Jaipur. The white walls and towers of the great tiger fort, accessible only from this one side, stands guard over the city. Beneath it, on the rocks, has been painted in giant letters the one word, Welcome, inscribed there for the visit of the Prince of Wales. Jaipur, the city of victory as its name implies, is considered the model city of a native state and it also carries off the palm for picturesqueness amongst all those artist-loved cities of india the native quarter surrounded by a wall forms a city within the city the broad streets of its bazaar are wider and different to anything of the kind that we have seen before the low shops are surmounted by a trellis carving uniform throughout the long street and all are colored that soft eastern pink deep enough here to be a terracotta color. The square marketplace, with its marble fountain in the center and flocks of pigeons, looks like some old Italian piazza, and the story is told that it was built to please the Italian love of one of the Maharajas of Jaipur. In keeping with the cleanliness and the air of brightness that generally pervades Jaipur, are the painted horns in red and green of the bullocks, the spirited and caparisoned horses of the Maharaja's attendants and messengers, and the bullock cart and smartly curtained ekkas with their magnificent yokes of trotting bullocks. A more than ordinarily large number of sacred bulls seem to be lying or wandering about the streets. There is the unusual sight of familiar rows of lamp posts once more, for Jaipur is the only city of a native state that is lighted with gas, and presently we pass the smoking chimney of His Highness the Maharaja's gas works, as the inscription of the gate tells us. It is the late Maharaja who has made Jaipur to what it is. Jaipur seems to be more advanced in art, education, and culture. Looking at its school of art, where the native manufactures of pottery are sold, the public library in the square, and the museum. This latter is formed by the specimens of native manufactures, such as kinkob, benares, and morshabad work, multan, and other potteries, exhibited at the Jaipur exhibition two years ago, and which owes its origin and tasteful arrangement chiefly to Dr. Hendley, the civil surgeon. At the end of a long street is the Palace of the Moon, which is attractive from its name, but not from anything in its interior. There are the usual ranges of courtyards and the two Durbar halls, gaudy in the extreme, of a glaring mural decoration of flowers and fruit. We were taken to the bottom of the garden, which commands a fine view of the Tiger Fort, and were rather disgusted to find it was only to see a billiard room in the pavilion. The Zenana, a palace in buff and blue, in the form of a roof of terraces ascending and diminishing towards the gold moon at the summit, is the prettiest thing about the Palace of the Moon.
adjoining is the large courtyard with the tower in the centre round which the maharaja's three hundred horses are stabled facing the palace at the other end of the long street is a cage where seven magnificent tigers are kept for the amusement of the public bars not as thick as the little finger are alone between us and these ferocious animals they crouch and glower in the furthermost corner and then spring forward as the keeper approaches with a wild roar that re-echoes down the street making the cage quiver with its reverberation the grandest tiger of all alone has double bars having once broken two with a forward spring then we drove to the palace of the winds a charmingly poetic name in keeping and resembling the fantastic facade in pink and white a series of little turrets with trellis-work windows filled in with green gratings allow of the wind passing freely through the palace ends with a succession of steps each one being crowned with a flag on a golden staff till they meet in the crowning step the keystone of the facade it stands at the top of a hill and is used as a summer residence there is nothing to see inside the whole idea has been exhausted on the exterior end of chapter nineteen part one chapter nineteen part two of forty thousand miles over land and water this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 40,000 Miles Over Land and Water by Ethel Gwendolyn Vincent. Gwelior and Rajputana, Part 2. The history of the present Maharaja of Jaipur is somewhat romantic formerly living in exile on an allowance of one pound per month he one day found himself raised to the throne and possessor of an income of half a million sterling his predecessor only settled the succession three hours previous to his death a usual custom among these eastern potentates on account of the fear of poison from a rival for favour and out of some hundred relatives with equal claims to the surprise of all he chose the present one who is now only twenty-three years of age in addition to the annual income there was found in the treasury half a million sterling in solid silver which took dr hendley twenty-three days to count over it has been our usual fate throughout our indian travels to find commissioners and officials of all sorts away in camp on their inspections which have to be got through just after the cold weather and before the advent of the hot maharajas and rajas have been absent on pilgrimages or a visit of welcome to lord dufferin so it is in the present instance the maharaja is at calcutta performing this duty and it will be remembered that sindha was ill the maharaja of benares returning the day after we left benares and later on we were destined similarly to miss seeing the nizham of hyderabad in the afternoon by special arrangement miss joyce the lady superintendent of the girls school kindly took me to see a zenana in fulfilment of my great wish there had been a death amongst the rajputs or great nobles at jaipur that of a promising young lad educated at mayo college and the elder ladies had gone to pay a visit of condolence to the family and during their absence the younger ones were not permitted to receive added to which until the twelfth day was over mourning or very plain dress would be de rigueur it was not in ancient days the custom for hindu women to be kept in the zanana or to be in purda literally behind the curtain the hindus first began to adopt the plan after the mohammedan invasion in imitation of their harem and now all the castes keep the women in purda save those only of the very poor class who cannot afford it the house we went to was that of sri lachman dat 
the high priest of the court. We were received in a small room on the ground floor of the palace, which, in true oriental fashion, was so much out of repair as to be tumbling down. This room was soon crowded with the brothers, sons, sons-in-law, and the numerous poor relations who are always hangers-on in the house of their rich kin. Altogether, they were a family of fifty, and with over one hundred servants, it brought up this one household to one hundred fifty persons, who all found shelter in the palace. Miss Joyce acted as interpreter, and a desultory conversation was maintained. The priest inquired our names, and C. handed him a visiting card, whereupon he called for paper and pen, and had his name written by his chaplain in exact imitation. The Shastri said that there were several members of his family ill, but that our visit was better than any doctor's and would make them well, etc., etc. At last a move was made, and the room cleared, the shutters closed, and C. taken away. When he had been deposited on the roof of the house by the gentlemen of the family, a position where he would be sure to be well out of sight, one after another the ladies slipped in to us. They were all dusky, dark-eyed girls, some beautiful and others that would have been so with their lustrous eyes but for coarse lips and thick noses you would almost think they had arranged their dresses so as to form a pleasing contrast for one was dressed in pale yellow with silver the other in orange with scarlet and another in pink and gold gorgeous gowns they were with the most extensive skirts miss joyce pulled one of them out for me to see and they are so finely gathered that an infinity of yards of stuff are compressed into one breadth and this makes them project at the bottom and swing like a crinoline all wore the sari over the head completely covering the neck and shoulders and the short-sleeved bodice underneath which just crosses the breast and nothing more they were laden with ornaments and only too delighted to take off each one separately to show me their bead necklaces with gold fringes their amulets, their bangles on the ankles, the arms, and above the elbow, their earrings two inches long weighed down with gold tassels, their nose rings as large as a bangle ring, and which one took out of her cartilage, allowing that it hurt her. Their feet gave the appearance of being covered with silver toe-piece, so massive were the rings and ornaments on each toe the rings for their hands were made joined for two fingers to pass through at once families of children and babies were brought and gathered into the room by degrees with their attendants who are treated quite on an equality and it was becoming very crowded when an enjoyment was suggested by miss joyce they were each taken by the hand and led upstairs to the zenana apartments here the rooms were small, but very neat and clean. The floors were all wadded and covered with linen to enable them to sit comfortably cross-legged on it. There were a few pictures on the wall, and they showed me a common cottage clock in a corner, which they evidently considered most curious and of priceless value. They took me into their sleeping apartments and made me sit down on their bed, lifting up the curtains and showing me their curious little cheek pillows laid across the bolster. And then they went up some narrow flights of stairs and passing a courtyard being repaired, whence the men had been carefully cleared by the eunuch and only fled when warned of C's existence on the top of the roof all this time left alone he had been carrying on a conversation by means of animated signs and they had been examining his watch hat and gloves with interest in descending we were shown the dunbar hall and one of the living rooms such a bare dirty dungeon on returning to the room the usual ceremony was gone through of the presentation of baskets of fruit the garland of flowers being thrown over our heads and the sticky paste of sandalwood and otto of roses smeared on the hands by the host and returned by the guest 
the zenana women are allowed very occasionally to drive out in a gari with the shutters closed and with muslin again hung before these but none of the servants or men of the household are even then allowed to see them save those only they have brought from their father's house it takes a long time before a chief can be persuaded to allow his zenana to be visited by a european lady and the present maharaja refused entrance to his zenana to the duchess of connaught because several of the other rajput maharajas have not allowed their zenanas to be seen by any european woman here then i say is the opportunity for the lady doctors of england when tired of struggling against the blind prejudice that continues to bar their way to advancement at home here is the wide field of usefulness the work of charity for their suffering and imprisoned sex these poor zenana women when the european doctor is called in and it is only in very bad cases he feels the pulse of the patient through the purja or sometimes through three or four the women suffer terribly and die from the want of ordinary skill and care particularly in their confinements when no doctor can be called in we visited the raj school established for girls and which corresponds to that of the college for boys miss joyce has enrolled on her books pupils who are classed as follows unmarried married or widows the hindu girls are married as early as ten years of age the education is supposed to be entirely secular but she has a class for religious instruction a sunday school at her bungalow on sunday we drove home through the zoological gardens which are extremely pretty and well laid out at their entrance is the mayo hospital dedicated to lord mayo by the late maharaja who was his personal friend and further on is the albert hall or town hall the memorial of the prince of wales visit jaipur is celebrated for its marble quarries of which so many of the beautiful buildings in india are built notably the taj we left jaipur that evening and arrived at ajmer at the inconvenient hour of midnight this did not prevent major locke the principal of the mayo college in his kindness coming to meet us at the station and driving us to his abode inside the grounds he has a most charming house for a bungalow it cannot be called as it possesses the remarkable feature for india of a staircase mayo college was founded by the late lord mayo for the education of the sons of rajahs it was a grand and statesmanlike idea this scheme for the education of the native ruler under the immediate guidance of english masterminds thereby engendering a patriotism and attachment to england as a mother country raising and elevating the tone and domestic life of the native prince who in his turn was being prepared to wield power humanely and make the influence of his bringing up felt on those around him it was the stone dropped in the pool with ever widening and concentric influence the college is very happily situated under the lee of an amphitheatre of hills that rise like all those in this part of the country sheer out of the plain it is a very charming feature of the college the ten houses of such very varied architecture and style that lie about the compound for each state has built and endowed its own college for the use of the sons of its nobles there has been a certain amount of rivalry exhibited in their erection some have marble cupolas others arches and others towers some are of pure white marble others a mixture of white and red stone all are tasteful and uncommon in the centre and holding them together as a mother university is the college hall with its clock tower entirely built of white marble but rough hewn and unpolished in the centre stands the statue of lord mayo the classrooms lie around it the white green pink and black marbles used for the decorations of the hall are all quarried within a radius of fifteen miles around ajmer 
these colleges are really boarding houses, where each prince brings his own establishment of servants. One lately admitted brought twenty-two retainers, which, with some difficulty, Major Loch reduced to eleven. They ride, play cricket, tennis, and football, and are encouraged to be as European in manners and habits as possible. With all this, Major Loch does not approve or encourage their being sent to England when their education is complete, as they return impressed with a sense of their own importance. Of the number of their servants, their jewels, their state, and magnificence compared to that of the same class in England. The native states represented by their colleges at Ajmer are as follows. Jaipur, Alwar, Bhutpur, Ajmer, Tonk Bikanir, Trupur, or Narvar, Kota, Thalawar, and Udaipur. It is often observed that the College of Jaipur stands apart from the others, the late Maharaja of Jaipur was very angry with Dolpur being allowed the first choice of sight, and so he built his college outside the compound. It is only lately that Major Loch has succeeded in smoothing his vanity and being allowed to include Jaipur, thus completing the circle. After seeing the college, we drove through the walled city of the native population, as Ajmer Bazaar is particularly picturesque and dirty. It lies on the hillside, and the glimpse of mountains as a background to the narrow streets adds to this effect. There is a very curious tank here, filled with slimy green water, which lies in a natural hollow on the hillside. Houses lie above it, and the marble courts and gilded minarets of a mosque overhang it on one side. The only access to the tank is by innumerable flights of irregular steps, running up and down in all directions. Up and down these steps are always staggering innumerable besties, bent under the weight of their bursting skins and disappearing through the archway of the passage tunneling through to the street. Then we drove to the Adhai Din Ka Gompra, which is very interesting on account of its being a Hindu temple with the facing of a Mohammedan mosque. The significance of its long drawn out name literally is the screen of two and a half days, which is generally supposed to mean that it was built in that short space of time. But Major Locke and others take a more practical view in suggesting that it meant compulsory labor from every man of two and a half days. The lofty arches are most splendidly carved, and verses of the Koran are introduced among the bold design of the tracery. Inside, you see irregular rows of Hindu pillars, carved with that grotesque figure life of the gods of Hindu religion. These pillars are easily detected to be in three separate pieces, and were doubtless piled on each other to give the necessary height for a Mohammedan mosque, by comparison with the low, intricate structure of pillars of a Hindu temple. General Cunningham, the archaeologist, considers this mosque the most interesting piece of antiquity in India. We are much struck, as are all new arrivals in India, with ridiculous number of servants required in one establishment. All say it is unavoidable, as each servant will only undertake one duty, and the wages given are extremely small. And there is another thing. You never know what your servant eats or where he sleeps. He finds himself in a very comprehensive sense of the term. The caste compels the first institution, and the second is in accordance with the habit of all natives. I thought it very strange at first to see the verandas full of recumbent figures wrapped in their quilts and striped blankets, and looking like so many corpses. They sleep on the mats outside the door, under a tree, or on the road. It is all the same to them where it is, so long as they may sleep long and heavily, for all natives are very somnolent. I think it may perhaps be interesting to give a complete list of servants necessary for the smallest Indian establishment. One, Sirdar bearer, body servant and valet. Two, Mate bearers, under bearers, one to wait on child and ayah. 
one or two ayas, maid and nurse. One kansama, literally lord of the stores, butler and head servant. Two kitmudgars, under table servants. One coachman. Two saises, or grooms for one pair of horses, the allowance being one saise and one grass cutter to every horse. Two gasyaras, grass cutters. One chuprasi, literally badge bearer, le carrier of letters and messengers. One sidar mati, head gardener. One or two mate mates, under gardeners. One behesti, water carrier. One mastachi, literally torch bearer, scullion. One cook. One mitu, sweeper. One mithrani, sweeper woman. One dobi, washerman. In all, twenty-three, and it must be remembered that all are absolutely necessary, as, for instance, no kit butgar or mati bearer would take a note or message in place of the chuprasi, and, above all, one native in a garden or elsewhere would do a fraction only of the work of the same man in England. Anglo-Indians are inordinate grumblers. There is much to be said on their side. The exile for the best years of their life, the return then to England to be looked down upon as a dried-up Indian official, the separation entailed from children, the same imposed upon wife from either husband or child, the extingencies of the climate, etc., but, on the other hand, it ought to be remembered that the salaries are very large, the pensions fairly so in proportion, and that they are enabled to have far more luxuries in India than they could possibly hope for at home. Abundance of horses and carriages, superabundance, I had almost said, of servants, at any rate sufficient to enable no Anglo-Indian ever to do or move for himself, and horses enough never to walk. I found a few, but yet a very few, who took this view of the case, allowing that at home they would keep two or at most three servants and have no carriages or horses. In the afternoon we drove to the lake, which is a beautiful feature of Ajmer. It is a lovely sheet of water, an Italian lake in miniature, with its marble balconies and platforms, with its white houses hanging over the water on the city side, while the other is formed by a range of mountains. It looked particularly smiling this afternoon, with a declining sun as we toiled up to the residency. This bungalow has a most perfect situation, built high up on a rocky platform, with broad veranda rooms overlooking the lake. It seemed a pity that Colonel Bradford, the resident, is only able to reside here for two months in the year. In returning, we passed the handsome stone building of the offices of the Rajputana Malwar Railway, whose headquarters are at Ajmer. The adjoining bungalows of officials and clerks form quite a line to themselves. In the evening, we performed the customary program of going to the club for an hour, and then the drive home in the dark was made romantically beautiful by the illumination of the tomb of an old saint on the mountainside, the lights seeming to glimmer and twinkle in mid-air in the density of the darkness. We left Ajmer that evening, catching up the mail train again at midnight, and travelling for eighteen hours all night and through the day, till we reached Ahmedabad at five this afternoon. Saturday, February 6th. Chota Hazri, after the usual Indian custom, and then a morning's sightseeing before breakfast at 10 a.m. Ahmedabad ranks in population as the second town in the Bombay Presidency, and the native quarters, as usual enclosed within a city wall, entered by no less than seventeen gates, is very large. There is very little of interest to be seen at Ahmedabad. We drove first to the Mughal Viceroy's palace, that of Azim Khan, which has two massive Norman towers flanking the gateway. 
it forms now a very suitable entrance for its present purpose for the ci devant palace is now the jail of the district on the other side lies the european quarter the jail thus forming the boundary line between the native and european populations by the side of the walls hidden away in a corner are the celebrated windows of the bahadar they represent the trunk branches and foliage of a single tree in each window in the carved and fretted stonework they are exceedingly beautiful so much so that copies of them are in the south kensington museum the Kankaria tank is very pretty, and with its raised causeway leading to the garden island in its mist, has become a favorite evening resort. Near here are seen to rise the beautiful minars of the Mosque of Shah Alam, the spiritual adviser and friend of Sultan Ahmad, the founder of the city. Within the court lies the tomb with double galleries of fretwork, its chief beauty and it is remarkable that each panel of the double screens is carved in a different pattern and device the canopy is of oak inlaid with mother-of-pearl precious now as it has become a lost art to the workmen of ahmedabad they have the uncomfortable custom here of covering the marble sarcophagi with precious stuffs thus on entering one of these tombs the effect produced is as of a row of coffins covered with palls more especially when as frequently wreaths are laid on them then we follow the usual round of mosques tombs and temples of which we as well as my readers i am sure are wearying the mosques being represented by the jama mosque a hindu temple with mohammedan arches and network of pillars date fifteen sixty seven the tombs by those of ahmad shah the aforesaid founder of the city and those of his queen the temples by a purely hindu one now called the mosque and tomb of rani sipre monkeys swarm in the city and look upon these temples and tombs as their rightful inheritance we notice a great difference amongst the lower orders now that we are in the bombay presidency as compared to that of bengal the natives look more well-to-do and are more clothed there are fewer of those savage clothed coolies with their single strip of muslin around the loins the neatly plaited hindu turban supersedes the hitherto more common loosely wound mohammedan one we left ahmedabad by the ten o'clock train and reached baroda at four thirty in the afternoon here we stayed five hours to catch up the mail train in the evening to bombay we were reduced to taking a curious native cart at the station for a drive round the city it was not quite an ekka nor yet quite a tea cart but a cross between the two and the small plank seats were put crosswise and not lengthwise one behind the other we jolted about in this for two hours till we suffered severely from a feeling of dislocation in many of our joints baroda is a small and pretty city without any pretensions to special interest save as the capital and residence of the celebrated gewar of baroda we drove first to the pretty garden where stands his summer-house and his cage of wild beasts the native quarter is very large more than usually picturesque and the four main streets meet in the lines of a cross at a gateway a lofty structure in white and yellow plaster here the guards keep watch a single sentry on the lofty platform of its tower commanding the whole view of the city from his post of observation we saw a sight unequalled for the artist-loving eye for at the moment a wedding procession was slowly threading its way from under the gateway below us streaming away down the street in gay ribbons narrowing with the perspective and finally disappearing through a grey gateway further away the blocks in the streets occasioned by the motley procession of echas and bullock carts and the acclamations of the crowd further added to the striking scene just beyond this gateway is the grand grim grey old palace of the gekwar 
A covered gallery leads to the blue and yellow quarters of the Zenana, seeming to tell of the airy fairy, do nothing life of the Zenana ladies by comparison with the sterner duties of the men as if the gehwa liked to pass from the duties of the grey palace to the light pleasures and recreation of the gay-coloured zenana the green buildings of the barracks are near and the orange and yellow veranda of the police station lower down together forming a vivid collection of colour the gehwa's cavalry paraded the streets in twos and threes, and a guard was in waiting outside the palace gate to accompany his carriage. We drove on further to see the gold and silver cannon. There are four gold cannon mounted on silver carriages kept in a yard where many white horses are stabled round, for in the prince's stables none but white horses are found. In returning to the station, we were fortunate enough to see another curious sight during our few hours' stay only at Barodo. Heralded by a mounted bodyguard and a running, shouting escort, the ladies of the harem passed swiftly by. The baroche was carefully closed and curtains, with a duenna standing up with the eunuch behind. The guard from the guardhouse turned out to salute, bugle, and beat a tattoo. We passed repeatedly leopards being paraded through the streets by their keepers, the pariah, or pie dogs, barking furiously at them. The animal strained at his chains and, walking with stealthy springing step, glared cautiously around for his prey. But the people do not fear their escaping and are very proud of their gehoir's wild beasts. There is an arena at Baroda where he occasionally holds a wild beast fight. We came back to the station by a beautiful and stately avenue of banyan trees. Leaving Baroda by the mail train that night, at seven the next morning we found ourselves stopped at the various stations along the great Queen's Road of Bombay, bordered by the sea. We drove to Watson's Hotel on the Esplanade, kept by the same proprietor, and a counterpart of the discomfort and dirt of the Great Eastern at Calcutta. We spent a quiet day driving out to Government House at Parel, six miles away from the town, and a far from pleasant drive through some native quarter. Sir James Ferguson is away at Calcutta, paying a farewell visit to the Viceroy, as he leaves India early in March. We went to the cathedral in the evening for service, as following the usual custom of always thinking it hot, the morning service is held at 7 a.m. It is to be observed that all Anglo-Indians labor under the idea of a perpetual and unabated heat in India. They always suggest you should start in the morning at some very early hour to be home before it is hot, and at all stations and in Calcutta and Bombay, the habit prevails of never going out driving in the evening till just before sunset and darkness, as there is little twilight in these southern latitudes. For ourselves, we have suffered more from the cold than the heat in India, but travelling in the winter gives, I am willing to allow, an erroneous idea of the climate, and gives you also no appreciable idea of the heat. Suffice it to say, O oh Anglo-Indians, that it is not always hot in India. End of chapter 19, part 2. Chapter 20 of 40,000 Miles Over Land and Water This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Prajakta. 40,000 Miles Over Land and Water by Ethel Gwendolyn Vincent The Home of the Parsis Monday, February 9th Sir Jamshedji Jiji Boy very kindly called for us in the morning with his break and magnificent pair of English carriage horses, undertaking to show us something of Bombay. 
Sir Jamshed Ji is the well-known and respected head of the Parsis, whose home may be said to be in Bombay. The Parsis claim to follow the oldest religion in the world, that of the Persian religion of Zoroaster, the fire worshipper, and of the hundred thousand which their set numbers, sixty thousand live in Bombay. Rampart Row leads to the Banyan border avenue of the Maidan or Park, but leaving this to our right, we drove on to the Esplande, the broad open space facing the sea which contains such a magnificent series of public buildings. Here are the Secretariat, the University Hall and Library designed by Sir Gilbert Scott, the Post Office, the clock tower with its carry lawns, the municipal offices and the high court, all pretty edifices in the architectural fancifulness of color and design, of buff brick with red, of interlacing arches and pillars. We surveyed this fine block from the parade ground where a small body of troops were being exercised and some young ladies enjoying their early morning canter, for it was as yet but 7 a.m. Then we drove along Queen's Road, the fashionable evening drive. I was going to say it bordered the seashore, but unfortunately, the line of the railway intervenes between it and the sea. This is the road which might be paved with gold. So great was the amount of the funds sunk by the company formed for the reclamation of this strip of land. It was the scene of ruin and despair for many of the Bombay citizens whose fortunes disappeared with the progress of the road. We looked into the Crawford markets for a minute and were surprised at the order and cleanliness the exception to the rule that where the native reigns there, there is filth, disorder and uncleanness. Then Sir Jamshedji took us to the art school, founded by his grandfather, the first baronet, by the gift of lakh of rupees. Mr. Griffith, an old South Kensingtonian, showed us through the various rooms where Beginning with freehand drawing up to modeling from their own designs, we saw classes of pupils receiving lessons here at the nominal fee of 1 rupee per month. Then we went across to the pottery works where Bombay ware is manufactured. This is a specialty of the city. The antique shapes of the vases and pots are often designed from the frescoes found in the caves of Ajanta and they are colored in rich and peculiar blues, browns and greens. It is very interesting to watch the pupils at work for each article is drawn and colored separately by hand. We drove through and in and out of the native quarter which is much broader and cleaner than that at Calcutta. Hindu temples abound with their throng of worshippers passing constantly up and down the steps and touching as they enter the deep toned bell, thus keeping it ceaselessly tolling. One street was quite blocked by an immense crowd streaming down a narrow byway. They were Hindus going to pay their daily visit rarely omitted to present a customary offering in kind to their bishop, a fat old man who sits almost naked in the court to receive their homage. Remains of the enthusiastic admiration of Lord Ripon on his departure from Bombay still remain in the long live Ripon. Dear Empress, send us another Ripon. A grateful people admire thee, O Ripon, inscribed over the doorways of the native houses. They say that no sight has ever equaled 
the extraordinary enthusiasm the enormous crowds that lined the 6 miles of road from government house at parel to the apollo bandar at bombay not even on the occasion of the prince of wales arrival were such masses of human beings seen then we went to the hospital and home for animals a very novel institution also founded and endowed by sir jamshed ji's father for a sum of 10 lakh of rupees to understand its full use and the benevolence of its purpose it must be remembered that according to the law of their religion no hindu is allowed to kill an animal it may be tortured in agony it may be blind and lame or if unable to work turn out into the streets to be ill used starve and die but never must it be put out of its misery a pious hindu will often pay some rupees to save an animal about to be slaughtered by the butcher and will afterwards bring it here to the home all animals lamed or maimed are received into this general hospital and attended to by a veterinary surgeon in the stalls full of oxen we saw some with a foot amputated others with sore backs or skin diseases others blind or otherwise injured horses oxen dogs goats cats fowls ducks even two porcupines and a tortoise are sheltered in this refuge there is the hospital where those are sent who are very ill and it is quite pathetic to see the poor animals here turning and looking dumbly at us as if asking for compassion when convalescent or case is pronounced incurable they are sent up to the mofusil or country home for change of air or else to pass the remainder of their natural term of existence leading an easy pleasant life in the compound those cured are sometimes given to people who are known to be human but never sent back to work such are the peculiar provisions and working of the hospital for animals we are certainly very much pleased with bombay when compared to calcutta there is so much more to see so many more places to drive to how charming we thought the quaint little corner by the sea the well known apollo bandar jetting out in three cornered fashion from the wharf how familiar we became with two characteristic features of bombay the arab horses that are used almost exclusively and the high cones of the peculiar parsi helmet there is always back bay to look at with the quiet expanse of water at high tide the slush with mussel shells at low tide lying and taking generous sweep inwards between the projecting promontories of kolaba and malbar or between the government house on the latter point and the lighthouse on the tongue of the former the queens road with the high walls of the burning ghat whence at night issues a lurid flame runs round to the bottom of malbar hill all the europeans reside on malbar hill and the many handsome bungalows hardly bungalows they can be called considering that they are nearly all two storied lie about among the palm groves facing seawards and overlooking the harbor the sea surrounds malbar point thus from both sides they catch stray breezes wandering about in summer time at the prettiest bungalow on malbar hill that of the commissioner of police sir frank sudar with whom lived the of chief justice sir charles sergeant we were destined subsequently to spend a very pleasant evening the ladies gymkhana is a special feature of the hill 
and here tennis and badminton in covered courts is played every evening while is the children hold their own reception amongst the swings and merry go rounds arriving on their donkeys and ponies with their numerous attendants when seen as we did this evening with the crimson sunset over the sea the light just appearing in the clock tower of the secretariat away down in bombay with the single bright lights dotted along queens road malbar hill looked very beautiful and then as we came down the steep hill and met all the residents returning home in the dusk after listening to the band on the esplanade we looked up and saw the three electric lights which have just been placed at the summit of the hill with such striking effect wednesday february 11th at 10 am we embarked in the police launch kindly lent us by sir frank sidder for a visit to the caves of elephanta 10 miles quick steaming across the harbor navigated by the smart crew in the pretty uniform of navy blue with scarlet sash and fez brought us to the so called jetty it consists of blocks of stone run out some distance into the sea but with large spaces left for it to wash between hopping over these interstices we landed and were carried up the hill in a dandy these wonderful caves are in the hillside that is to say they have been sculptured out of the solid wall of rock in its side having a roof several hundred feet thick the pillars seem to support the upper mass but they do not really do so as in several instances capitals like huge stalactites are left suspended the pillar beneath having entirely disappeared on entering we find ourselves confronted by monster figures mythological giants carved in the relief on the wall and in the recesses of the cave one group represents the amazon goddess durga the wife of shiva with a single breast she is riding on the sacred bull and the face of passive endurance the large meek eyes of the animal are very characteristic in a recess part we see a god and goddess with arms closed together the hands broken but showing that they were joined the goddess stand at his right hand in ancient days the position in marriage and on both faces there is such a happy expression the face of the god in particular beaming with a smile that it leads one to believe they were in the act of being united there is a crescent concealed in a corner here while a cross probably unintentional can be traced in the bas relief opposite in this latter there is a beautiful allegorical picture the upper part represents a fresco of angels or beings employed in doing good this is immortality the higher and better part of life while is below on earth stands durga in revengeful attitude holding the bowl for the blood of the victim being sacrificed to her that is the mortal the cruel the low representation of the hindu religion the preservation of these caves is most remarkable you see palm trees demons skulls the beads of a necklace the protruding bumps on the forehead of a god all distinctly preserved while on the other hand pillars and legs and arms of the figures are entirely wanting one wonders how and by what means the one was destroyed and the other preserved two inscriptions have been discovered but are at present undecipherable and the exact date of the cave remains therefore in mystery they are however generally supposed to be about 4000 years old and without doubt 
they originally joined to the mainland in the afternoon sir jamshed ji jiji boy took us to the parsi towers of silence many think the rite of burial as performed by the parsis by exposing the body on an open tower to be devoured by vultures is not only wanting in respect to the dead but is a revolting and disgusting feature of their religion i know that the european inhabitants of bombay cordially participate in the latter feeling for ourselves whatever we may have thought or heard previously after visiting and having explained to us the tower of silence we came away greatly impressed with the beauty of many of the thoughts it suggested it can hardly be believed what living significance each act has nor what tender and solemn thoughts rest around the poetic name of the tower of silence five round white towers stand in different parts of a garden situated amid the palm groves of the hill top it is surrounded on two sides by the sea and the fresh salt breezes are forever blowing over the peninsula and rustling among the palm trees shining in the utter stillness and silence of all around according to the zoroastrian religion earth fire and water are sacred and very useful to mankind and in order to avoid their pollution by contact with putrefying flesh the faith strictly enjoins that the dead bodies shall not be buried in the ground or burned or thrown into the sea rivers and etc therefore in accordance with these religious injunctions the towers of silence are always situated on some hill or eminence away from the city no expense is spared to their construction that they may last for centuries without the possibility of polluting of the earth or contaminating any living beings dwelling therein no single soul since the consecration and use of the towers has been allowed to go or see inside them save only the corpse bearers these latter are main kept sacred for the purpose and they are divided into two classes named nasalers and khadiyas the former having gone through certain religious ceremonies are alone privileged to carry the corpse into the towers while is the latter act as a bearers at the funeral the model of the tower in the garden shows us their construction there is a circular platform inside about 300 feet in circumference which is entirely paved with stone slabs and divided into three rows of shallow open receptacles corresponding with the three moral precepts of the zoroastrian religion good deeds good words good thoughts the first row is for corpses of males the second row is for corpses of females the third row is for corpses of children they diminish towards the center in size footpaths are left for the corpse bearers to move about on the clothes wrapped round the bodies are removed and destroyed by being cast into a pit of chloride of lime naked we came into this world and naked we ought to leave it the parsis maintain a deep central well in the tower the sides and bottom of which are also paved with stone slabs is used for depositing the dry bones the corpse is completely stripped of its flesh by vultures within an hour or two of being deposited and the bones of the denuded skeleton when perfectly dried up by atmospheric influences and the powerful heat of the tropical sun are thrown into this well where they crumble into dust thus the rich and the poor meet together on one level of equality after death to observe the tenet of zoroastrian belief 
that the mother earth shall not be defiled this well is constructed on the following principle there are holes in the inner sides of the well through which the rain water is carried into four underground drains at the base of the tower for it must be remembered that the well like the rest of the tower is all exposed and open to the air at the end of each of these drains pieces of charcoal and sandstone are placed to act as a filter thus purifying the water before it enters into the ground the vultures nature scavengers do their work much more expeditiously than millions of insects would do if dead bodies were buried in the ground by this rapid process putrefaction with all its concomitant evils is most effectually prevented along the straight white road up the steps winds the procession always on foot the mourners and friends are all clothed in pure white wear flowing full dress robes walking in pairs and each couple are hand in hand and joined together by holding a handkerchief between them in token of sympathetic grief the body is carried on an iron bier by an appointed bearers at the gate of the garden it is borne away out of their sight to the chosen tower where generally some other relative has been previously laid the mourners may follow it no longer and turn towards the room kept for that purpose where a religious service is held it is within sight of the temple where the sacred fire of zoroaster is eternally kept burning glimmering out in the silence and darkness of the night to the towers of the dead shadowing forth the glimmer of truth which is yet found in this ancient religion quoting as i have previously done from the description of the model of the tower of silence as drawn up by the able parsi secretary he sums up their religion in the following simple words according to the zoroastrian religion the soul is immortal men and women are free moral agents and are responsible to the great creator for their acts and deeds in proportion to their good or bad acts and deeds they meet with rewards or punishments in the next world pious and virtuous persons meet with happiness but the wicked and sinful suffer pain and misery thus as will be seen in the parsi towers of silence each act each form of ceremony shows forth some scriptural type some moral reason suggests some holy truth apart from these there is the other important consideration of the benefit thereby obtained to the living in these latter days when overcrowded cemeteries and the leveling of graveyards in the midst of our metropolis have called forth the cry of ashes to ashes dust to dust by some new means and some means quicker than the old when even cremation has come within the bounds of possibility surely the parsi model of burial will command itself to many forcing minds true that we do not like to think of the vultures hovering around the funeral procession for the last few miles nor of others awaiting it perched on and greedily gazing down into the tower but is it so much worse than the millions of insects of the ground of our burial of which the parsi speaks with such horror all morbid feelings aggravated by frequent visits of the graveyard are thus avoided we are told that one hour after the body has passed through that small hole in the tower it is reduced to its natural state no gradual decay no mouldering scarce any remains it is known that according to the parsi burial 
each body is reduced to one handful of dust. Thus, within the last half century, more than 50,000 persons have been buried in these towers and yet there is no end to their capacity for room. The Parsis as a body are most enlightened and civilized and not to be named with the Hindus. They are European in comparison and without doubt it is in great measuring owing to their true and moral religion of which the rite of burial, the Tower of Silence is the most beautiful feature. Thursday, February 12th C. Met a large influential gathering of representative natives and editors of vernacular press at the Native Public Library called together by the Honorable K. Telang. They explained to him their views upon the leading Indian questions of the day and dwelt strongly upon the urgent necessity of education for their women. We had a drive in the evening out to Baikala where many rich Parsi merchants have houses. It was one of those beautiful seashore drives with salt breezes and waving palm trees that makes Bombay, I think, such a pleasant place of residence. Our last day in India had come. It was our farewell remembrance and India has been by far the most interesting country of our travels hitherto. Who could help being charmed and engrossed with the multitude and antiquity of the monuments of the past? It is not the intention of this volume to give more than a simple account of our travels, but for those who care to study the mystic poetry and religion that is interwoven with the history of the wild tribes who, horde after horde, race after race, pierced through the passes of Afghanistan and from Central Asia, that breeding place of all nations, poured down upon this vast country there is literature enough already. It is truly said, India forms a great museum of all races in which we can study man from his lowest to the highest stages of culture. The specimens are not fossils or dry bones, but living tribes, each with its own set of curious customs and rites. I have, however, been very unfavorably impressed with an Anglo-Indian life, not so much from a man's, perhaps as from a woman's point of view. If of active temperament, health will in time suffer from exertion during the hot season and if otherwise inclined, it is a life of such utter laziness as to unfit anyone for life at home afterwards. The social life at civil and military stations is and must always be click in the extreme. We had grumbled ceaselessly at the atrocious hotels with their cold comfort, at the life and habits in general, at many things, Indian and Anglo-Indian, and yet now turning homewards, our feelings were softened and we were sorry to think of leaving another of the new country scene and to think that another period of proscribed time had slipped away so quickly. Henceforth, our travels were destined to be on beaten tracks. With a sigh of pleasurable regret, we stood on the deck of the P&O steamer Peshawar and steamed past the ugly docks and frontage, which must create such an unfavorable impression on new arrivals to Bombay, looked our last on Bag Bay and on Kolaba Lighthouse, on Malbar Point and Malbar Hill. We stood out to sea and lost sight of Indian soil in the growing dusk of twilight. End of chapter 20
Part One of Forty Thousand Miles Over Land and Water. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Forty Thousand Miles Over Land and Water by Ethel Gwendolyn Vincent. Through Egypt, Homewards, Part One. Life on board the well-known decks of the P&O is too familiar to require much record. A swell from the coast on the first day is the usual experience, and ours proved no exception. Few were ill, but all, including ourselves, felt more or less uncomfortable. Fortunately, we are too early for the swarm of Indian mothers who, with their tribes of spoilt and sickly children, will be setting homewards next month before the heat begins, for seventy children is no uncommon number at that season of the year. Five days slipped by thus pleasantly, and on Thursday morning the 19th, at 5.30, we were lying off Aden. I looked out of my porthole and saw the jagged, smoke-colored peaks of Little Aden, dull against the rosy, flushed clouds. Presently, when I could get dressed and escape through the clouds of cold dust, outside my deck cabin door, I saw the yet grander and picturesque peaks of the rock mountains of Aden proper. The decks were seatless and smeared with sand, and everything in a pitiable condition from the coaling operations. On a very dull, cloudy morning, Aidan looked more than usually dreary. C had gone ashore to find out the latest news on the reopening of Parliament, as upon that depended whether we should continue homewards in the Peshavur or disembark and await the messengeries' boat for the Cape via Maritus at Aden. He returned reassured, and we gladly accepted the kind hospitality tendered to us by General Blair, the President. To the passing traveller from the deck of the P and O, Aden presents the appearance of a small station with some white, low roofed buildings and military lines, utterly sterile, utter desolation, exposed to the baking heat of the tropical sun, reflected in tenfold intensity from the rocks round. Yet the magnificent rough-hewn boulders of rocks piled up into mountains behind Aden have a certain stern beauty and wild grandeur of their own. It is like what one imagines Mount Sinai to be on a near approach, only darker and more awe-inspiring, less humanly attainable. Among the deep clefts and along the bold crags of the skyline, you can trace strange profiles of unknown faces or the outline of an animal, and the longer you look, the more distinct and lifelike they become. On the somber, purple-blue colors of these mountains are reflected the glowing colors of the sunset, changing them to warm matter, brown, and pink. There is no sign of vegetation, no green thing will grow, withered by the hot winds that blow across the sandy wastes of Arabia, but what Aden loses by living nature, she gains from her in artificial means. The glory of the sunset and sunrise over the Indian Ocean is unparalleled. Again, I say, Aden has beauties of her own, which, like others, we had imagined very much absent. The formation of the peninsula is a very puzzling bit of geography, but the cliffs and capes formed of those loosely bound masses of boulder jut out strikingly and unexpectedly into the sea. Their blue-gray tints dip into the turquoise-colored ocean, and with a strip of yellow sand form the only three colors that can be found at Aden. It would hardly be believed what natural signal stations are ready to hand. The mounds, not of earth but of rocks, seem naturally to taper into the crowning flagstaff. A grand command of the gates of the Red Sea, the coast of Arabia, and the Indian Ocean has the signal station on the summit of the highest point, 1,300 feet sheer up. In the afternoon, Mrs. Blair took us for a drive, the one drive it must be confessed, along the Bunder, or seashore, to the military depot at the Isthmus. 
Descending into the hollow, we saw the sapper and miners' lines, the barracks and the hospital, the church and the bungalows of the P and O and messengeries agents, who form the civilian community of Aden. Then driving along the seashore, the town, with its hotels and shops, contained in the one sweep of the Prince of Wales Crescent. Camels striding over the sandy desert by the roadside, and a strange mingling of desert tribes seem the natural accompaniments to this sand of Arabia. We saw sturdy Arabs with their thick legs and short-set frame, Persians, Indians, Somalis, Sudanese, and Nubians, the latter tribes as black as soot, Jews whom we knew by their funny little corkscrew curls bobbing on either side of the face, and who are still here the downtrodden race of the twelfth century, degraded and trampled upon by the Arab. Then there are a tribe of fishermen called the Eastern Pirates, and most romantic-looking with their wild daredevil faces and long smoked yellow robe, the color of one of their own weather-worn sails. The Arabs have their heads plastered with white clay, found along the coast, which turns the color of the hair to a bright yellow, making it at the same time stiff and frizzy. The Arab women have their faces covered with a thin, spotted handkerchief, but even without this you would single them out by their easy, swinging walk. Women of other tribes wear their hair en chignon, covered with black muslin and red or orange saris crossed over the chest to leave their black arms free. We drove along the rocky rampart, which reminds me much of a smaller, a very much smaller range of rocky mountains. You soon grow accustomed to expect nothing but rocky surfaces and sand at Aden, and are quite surprised at the suspicion of green under the lee of the range, a little wild mignonette, snapdragon, or lupine, a pretty flower with a terrible odor, which are trying to exist there. We pass several unenclosed and disused Mohammedan cemeteries by the roadside, and at last see the end of the three straight miles of Bandar in the rock fortress ironically named the Last Refuge. Three hundred and seventy-five steps lead up the face of the rock to its isolated summit, where, provisionless though impregnable, the fortress would quickly surrender. By the side of this fortress we pass under a gateway, and are in the camp of the Isthmus, the regiment of British infantry and the native troops quartered at Aden are divided into three camps, that at the Isthmus, the camp at the crater, and the camp at Aden itself. This foolish separation gives rise to much inconvenience and consequent grumbling among the officers. Where the community is so small, it seems a pity they should be so unsociably distant. We watched the cricket match that was being played by the sons of the military against the sons of the civilians. The ground was curiously white and glistening from the salt which exudes after rain from the earth and which makes it very slippery. The stillness when driving home again was quite extraordinary, not a breath to stir a ripple on the water. Friday, February 20th. Every afternoon at three o'clock, the danger flag is hoisted opposite the presidency, and a great bombardment commences. The fortifications so long needed are in progress, and every day the entrenchments are blasted away by gunpowder. From the one nearest, the first explosion is heard, sending up clouds of smoke and a shower of stones into the air, which rattle and roll down a rocky ravine on to the beach. One report after another follows quickly, and then when these begin to decease and die away, those from the opposite fort take up the role of artillery, the smoke, the rattle of hailstone shot. We drove that afternoon to the crater, to the camp inside the crater, a unique position in the world for one, I should say. From the inevitable drive along the bunder, we turned off and made our way up a zigzagging hill of great steepness, towards an archway very far above us, built into the rocks. The road ended in a wall of rock, 
and the entrance under the gateway was not seen till you reached it, because it was immediately on the right hand at a sharp angle. Here we found ourselves in the pass, a very grand and striking one from the vertical height of the crags and the depth we had sunk in below them. The arch we passed under was formed to bridge over the gulf and connect the two lines of fortification running up on either mountain side. This pass was pickaxed out of the mountain rock, and very beautiful is the blood-red granite and the green serpentine colors it has exposed to view. Here and there we see a vertical strata of lava embedded in the rock. We are inside the crater now. A wonderful scene it is. Black rocks of lava and scoria, irregular and jagged at the top like the mouth of a crater, rise up all around, and down in the hollow in their midst lies the camp and village, a collection of white buildings. The dull red color of the scoria gives one the impression that the flames have been a very recent date. There are the caverns, the caves, the cones of lava left by the eruption, the formation of a volcano but active the other day. The heights are bristling with cannon-pointed seawards. A tunnel connects with the camp at the Isthmus, which really is only on the other side. We pass through the native quarter and the camel market. Here we see the Aden white sheep with black heads and the lumps of fat protruding from each haunch. Far up in the side of the crater lie the wonderful tanks, the one object of interest in Aden. Supposed to have been made somewhere around 400 B.C., their existence was never suspected till 1851, some 20 years after our occupation. A freshet of water after the rains coming down the side of the rock led to their discovery. The tanks are on a platform, and there are six of them, mounting higher and higher into the gully in the crater. They are all enormously deep and communicated by channels, and all have been cut out in the rock. They are capable of holding four million gallons of water when filled during the rainy season. The water is then gathered up behind a sluice, and a native climbing up by the rail and ropes we saw opens it and lets the water down with a rush, which generally fills the first three or four tanks. At this season of the year they are dry, and we saw the yellow tuna mortar that the tanks are whitewashed with, and the natural formation of rocks rounded and worn by the action of the water. Not the least charming part about these tanks is the green peepul tree, looking oh so fresh and green, growing in its crevasse by the tanks and shading the well. It is the one green spot in the midst of scoria, dust, and ashes. I remarked how healthy the children in the camp looked, having lately come from India, but was told that it is a fact that troops coming from there are always known to improve and pick up at Aden. It seems strange to say of so of such a climate, for we ourselves found the heat and breathless stillness at night very trying. I believe the good health of the station is attributable to the water, which is all condensed and therefore very pure, and very precious also, being doled out in an allowance of three gallons per person daily. The storm clouds gathering round the crater at sunset produced a wonderfully grand and gloomy effect and then the drive home by moonlight with a last glimpse back at the camp in the crater from the pass the swift gallop along the bunder behind the pretty arab horses brought us quickly home at last after being for four days in that most uncomfortable of all conditions viz unable to make up one's mind our plans have been decided for us by the arrival of the messengeries boat this afternoon the question appeared simple enough should we go one day south to the cape in the messengeries boat or the next day north through the red sea homewards in a p and o in reality it was very complex we longed to complete our tour round the british empire to see the last of our great rural dominions the cape but then on the other hand the political horizon was cloudy and a vote of censure on the gladstone administration was pending 
we should have we found to wait twenty-five days at the Mauritius, to which there is no cable, before getting a steamer to take us to Natal and Cape Town. This would sever us from telegraphic news, and effectually prevent any immediate and sudden return home in case of a dissolution. We decided, therefore, against the Cape project, and great as was the disappointment at the time, events so far justified our decision that we cannot wholly regret it. At 5 p.m. the next morning, the P.N.O. Brindisi was signaled, and soon afterwards we saw her from the residency windows anchoring in the bay. It was not long before we rode out to her and were on board. Coaling operations added to the disorganization always attendant on a ship in port gave us a rather uncomfortable evening. At nine o'clock we saw an Italian man-of-war bound for Massaway stealing out to sea, so noiselessly she moved, as the huge ship loomed black in the dusk to our starboard. The heat was very great downstairs in the cabins, and we got no rest till eleven o'clock when we cleared away from Aden. Wednesday, 25th. The captain's compliments, and we are passing Perim, shouted at my cabin door at seven a.m. the next morning, summoned me hastily on deck to see that rocky island at the mouth of the Red Sea. The morning sun shone brightly and brought out in full relief its excessive barrenness. We ran up our flag in response to the salute from the stone fort, which looks appropriately cold and ugly. The two ships wrecked on the rocks around Perim tell how inhospitable are her shores. The Italian warship of the night before was just disappearing round the corner of the island to take the broader channel. I prudently refrained from mentioning the two well-known little stories of the capture of Perim and one of the officers who subsequently occupied, or rather was non-resident there. Notwithstanding all its natural disadvantages, Perim is destined very soon now to rise into importance as a port of call. From the reap in early childhood, we are taught to seek the Red Sea as a narrow strip of blue against the yellow outline of Egypt and Arabia. It is difficult, then, to realize you are in such a well-known spot when on neither hand is there any coastline. We only know we are on the great highway and that its limits are confined from the numerous ships we are constantly passing. One day four P and O's were actually in sight of one another, an almost unprecedented event, I believe. We have a good sea running, but the ship is splendidly steady, and there is a following wind, the one most dreaded in the Red Sea, but it is too early in the year to be very hot. We passed the three brothers in the afternoon, and twelve apostles in the evening. All these islands are covered with white sand, which glistens in the sunlight by day and the moonlight by night. Thursday, 26th, past Surkim, unseen, whither transports without number are hurrying at this moment. At five o'clock this morning was sighted Mount Sinai, but to my intense disappointment I had forgotten to ask overnight the time, and when I came up on deck at eight o'clock I could only see the range. It is forty-five miles away, and rarely seen clearly, but had been today. On this quiet Sunday morning, the service on deck seemed peculiarly appropriate, when almost within the view of the Holy Mount and those sandy shores of Arabia that are fraught with such holy memories. The sea is narrowing. We have a coastline now on either hand. The pale yellow sand of Arabia against the faint blue of the sky gives a look of such atmospheric heat, so like what we have always pictured to ourselves the Holy Land. On the other are the more rugged mountains, bare and rocky, of the coast of Egypt, mountains that have a very purple hue, that are grand and solemn in their outline, which occasionally open out to show a glimpse of the desert beyond. Narrower and narrower grows our channel. The land is closing in as towards 5 p.m. we approach Suez, and see in the distance the few buildings, with the large storehouse, which marks the entrance to the canal.
we anchor opposite a messengery vessel, and soon after we have taken up our position, are followed by another P&O, the Ballarat from Australia. Who could conceive the loveliness of the sunset tints that evening? I, for one, have never seen, nor could imagine that such heavenly shades in such inextricable harmony could have existed in nature. On the fair coast of Arabia there was seen the most delicate electric blue, with just such a suspicion of mauve that you knew not whether it was there or not, with a distinct dash of pink, distinct because it clashed with the streak of yellow sand. It was sublime. The usual indecision followed us as to whether to land at once or not but being hastily decided in the negative we spent a moonlight evening on board sleep came with difficulty that night for strange as it seems we missed the lullaby of the throb of the engines and the noisy revolution of the screw it was at five the next morning that we got up in the middle of the night as it appeared and dressed hastily for the steam launch which was to come at five thirty the captain was weighing anchor and preparing to go into the canal at daybreak we collected our goods and stumbled cold and sleepy into the launch as we crossed the harbour we saw sunrise over the egyptian hills and watched it gradually eclipse the moonlight at suez there were sixty ships hired as transports by the government ships of all sorts rusty paintless and out of date but pressed into service for this emergency two thousand camels whose humpy backs in the dawn at first gave the appearance of a line of sand hills were waiting on the isthmus for transportation to suakim and the wharf covered with tents and military stores showed the bustle and activity of war at this wharf we waited for two weary hours and a half cold and breakfastless till a train dirtier than any we have ever previously seen arrived to take us to suez old familiar suez say some of the passengers just the same as ever with her awful wastes her salt marshes strewn with rusty bolts and ends of iron her mud huts and pariah dogs the dreary desert scene at suez we looked forward to breakfast rejecting the offer of the donkey boy pointing to his donkey with a persuasive quite a masher we walked through the road ankle deep in sand when bond street led us to the hotel de suez on the quay small chance was there among the collective passengers of three ships just arrived of getting anything like a comfortable breakfast and the scramble for food that ensued was a painful sight we felt glad we had not left the ship to sleep at the hotel last night when we heard that a few nights ago three generals had been doubled up as i was expressively told us by a soldier in one room and three colonels in the next the place was swarming with soldiers military chests tin cases bundles of bedding etc just landed and awaiting orders to proceed to swahim at length we started in the train over the line which gives us our first impression of the desert the vast expanse of waterless wasteless sand parched and glaring weary even unto death where life can have no attraction left for man or beast where all is desolate and dead to life how intense then must be the longing for the shadow of the great rock in the weary land yet under the influence of the late sir herbert stewart's brilliant march through the desert yet under the excitement of our hard-won victory at abu Klea, and later that at metameh we think with a realizing anguish of the horrors of the prolonged marches the deadly thirst our men must have endured here our eyes find some relief in patches of bulrushes and the blue strip of water of the canal where we see the line of steamers slowly passing along in single file each appearing to chafe at the slow progress of the foremost one the messengeri leads the way followed by our brindisi in its turn followed by the ballarat in the order in which they entered the canal this morning at its widest part the canal opens out into an inland lake 
Again, our hearts are stirred as we approach the scene of the battle of Tel el Kabir, as we see the roughly thrown up entrenchments behind which the Arabs lay hidden as our troops came over onwards, cautiously and noiselessly, for it was the night of the now famous silent march. We could hear the British cheer, the maddening rush, the wild swoop which carried all before it. We saw the bridge over which the frantic retreat was made, we saw, too, the green cemetery by the line, where a few white stones marked the graves of those who were left still and cold on that battlefield. There are no remains to be seen from the railway line, no carcasses or bleached bones, no skeletons of camels or broken weapons, but only that long, long rows of low entrenchments, like sand bank, extending for two or three miles. At Zagazik we had luncheon, and a very dirty journey brought us to within sight of Cairo, whose first and distant view is disenchanting. It looks little more than a large native village with a citadel and a few minaret towers. My husband's brother, the financial adviser to the Egyptian government, met us at the station and we drove to his house made beautiful by his splendid collection of embroideries that have been drawn from the wealth of such stores in the bazaars of Constantinople, Brosa, Egypt, and Arabia. We feel in the world once more. We have returned to civilization. The sound of the war tramp echoes through Cairo. The streets are full of officers, transport wagons, and stores. The almost historical balcony of Shepherds is peopled with a military throng, with officers eager to go to the front, with others awaiting further orders. All connected with the service have additional importance in their own and everyone else's eyes just now. Wives and relations are in Cairo, as nearer the seat of war and within earlier reach of news, though, as a matter of fact, the news of the fall of Khartoum the other day was known a day earlier in London. Rumors and panics of defeat, repulse, surprise, are rife, and all is excitement and anxious flurry. Colonel Swain, C.B., military secretary to Lord Wolseley, came here early this morning on his way home on sick leave. He will be the first to arrive from the camp at Corte in London. He gave us some interesting particulars about the Battle of Abu Klia. Cairo strikes me as being so French in tone, with the parquet floors and the French windows, with its French population, with Parisian fashions. But, after all, one must disillusion oneself from the natural idea that Cairo is now English. Cairo is, above all things, an international metropolis. During our week's stay there, we saw most of the principal sites, but I have not the smallest intention of boring my readers with attempting any minute description, save of the pyramids and the dancing dervishes, of what has been told in glowing, lifelike pictures by other writers of name and fame. I will not write of the streets with their motley crowd of Arabs, Copts, Syrians, Jews, Greeks, Armenians, Nubians, Karines proper, with their thousands of donkeys and accompanying hamars, handsome animals cruelly bitted and curved, ridden alike by grave official in Turkish bags, embroidered jacket, and fez, or by Arab ladies with balloon of silk and feet tucked up in front nor of the pretty street cries, God will make them light, O oh, lemons, odors of paradise, O oh, flowers of henna, nor yet even of the bazaar, where are spread out the treasures of gold and silver of Arabia, Persia, and Syria, of Damascus and Baghdad, the Cairo bazaar unique in the world. It is terrible to see the number of those afflicted with eye diseases in Cairo and many blind men led about the streets crying o oh, awakener of pity o oh, master or i am the guest of god and the prophet and then the answer comes god will succour or give thee succour it makes one's heart ache too to see the babies with the flies the proverbially persistent fly of egypt settled black on the child's eye and with no attempt being made to brush them away causing the eye to close by a process too frightful to describe. 
The children are always sucking sugar cane, and it is by the sticky sweetness which causes the flies to settle so thickly on their cheeks. We were much struck with the fineness of the mosques in Cairo after seeing those of India. As Mohammedanism was only a later introduction into India, a faith struggling in a new land, so are its mosques but a feeble reproduction of those in the land of the Prophet, the home of Mahomet. The mosque of Sultan Hassan is a grand spot for worship. It is not beautiful, nor curious, nor interesting, but it is simply majestically imposing from the height of its walls. They present an immeasurable surface, pierced only by lancet recesses, which, by their narrow length, add only to the grandeur of the wall. It is from the ancient to the modern we proceed, as we go to the alabaster mosque of Muhammad Ali at the citadel, where all is gaudy and modern, turkey carpets, colored glass windows, and rows of glass globes. We look lastly at the celebrated view from the citadel, which is certainly most beautiful. End of chapter 21, part 1. Chapter 21, part 2 of 40,000 Miles Over Land and Water. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 40,000 Miles Over Land and Water by Ethel Gwendolyn Vincent Through Egypt, Homewards, Part 2 Thursday, March 5th At six in the morning we started on our expedition to the pyramids. Passing the enormous square of Kezer Ernil Barracks and crossing the lion-guarded bridge of the same name, we soon distanced the town. Coming in from the surrounding country, all along the roads, we met trains of camels and troops of donkeys laden with the day's forage for Cairo. The green grass looked rich and succulent, swaying in mountainous stacks on either side of the camel, and balancing across the donkeys in loads that hid all except their four legs walking underneath. Sandy and barren, as is the desert of Egypt, where irrigation is brought into use, the crops are extraordinarily rich and luxuriant. Added to which, they cut with impunity crop after crop of clover and green food without dreaming of allowing the ground to lie fallow during any part of the year. Thus it is that around Cairo, though really only the desert, it looks a green and cultivated plain. The canals are cracked and dry, but will fill with the rising of the Nile, which, irrigating the land and overflowing with its muddy waters, leaves that rich alluvial deposit of fertility. The last four miles approach to the pyramids is over a road shaded by an avenue of tamarinds, so straight that you can see a man, a speck, at the end. We read, we imbibe unconsciously, we listen eagerly to the account of impressions of some world wonder, some object of exceptional beauty or interest. We cannot help longing to see that object. We cannot help feeling some excitement when we are nearing that wonder, which we have been picturing to ourselves for so long, when we are nearing the realization of an oft-expressed wish since childhood. Thus it is. And thus it is that we often realized some disenchantment. I had often done so, but nothing will ever come up to the keen intensity of my disappointment or the bitter revulsion of feeling as we approached the pyramids and obtained a good view of them. They may grow grander as we come nearer, I said, but no, I think they really diminished rather than increased on a nearer approach. The pyramids stand on a natural platform of rock. The three are in a line. The second, or pyramid of Chephren, touches the angle of the first, or that of Cheops, and that of the third, the pyramid of Mycerinus, that of Chephren. 
Thus, as you draw near, it becomes a line of perspective in which each pyramid recedes and recedes behind the greater one, till only Cheops is left in solitary glory. But even thus he does not seem stupendous. He does not seem to crush you with his size, to be ungraspable from height, to be immeasurable for width. He does not impress you with the feeling of your own insignificance. He is very large, that is all. Even when we had driven up the last steep ascent and stood under his very shadow, I felt scarcely more impressed. There was a peculiar effect of following with the eye some way up, and then suddenly feeling that the pyramid was receding from your sight when you saw that you were looking at its comb. You must gaze upon the pyramids, bearing in your mind's eye all the time the grand idea that called them into existence, the despotic monarch who thought to build for himself an everlasting monument, who thought by the stupendousness of the work to preserve his body when all others should have perished, to perpetuate the memory of his reign to worlds of generation. The vanity of all human aims and desires. The tomb was opened, sacked for the treasures of gold and silver that so great a builder would surely have interred with his remains. And the bones of Cheops, where are they now? Consigned to the sand of the desert, to the dust whence he came. It is wonderful to think that this outer pyramid is only the covering for a number of smaller ones inside. How many is only conjectured by the size of the outer one. When the building of a pyramid was commenced, a piece of rock, it is said, was taken as the center to form the support of the apex of the first tiny pyramid, and then a space was hollowed out in the rock wherein the sarcophagus would rest some day. The pyramid grew with the length of the reign of the royal builder. Year by year its growth increased, and at his death it was finished off at the point it had then reached. Various theories have been advanced as to the use of the pyramids. Some have thought they were for astronomical purposes. One, that it was simply a meteorological monument, large enough to serve for all kinds of measurements. But Egyptologists are now agreed in thinking they are tombs hermetically sealed everywhere, the forever impenetrable casing of a mummy. There are many who would share in Lord Lindsay's beautiful but mystic idea of their origin, but I, for one, do not. Temples or tombs, monuments of tyranny or of priestly wisdom, no theory as to the meaning of the pyramids, those glorious works of fine intelligence, has been broached so beautifully to my mind as old Sandys, who, like Milton and the ancients, believed them modeled in imitation of that formless, form-taking substance, fire, conceives them to express the original things. For as the pyramid, beginning at the point, little by little dilateth into all parts, so nature, proceeding from an individual fountain, even God, the sovereign essence, receiveth diversity of form, effused into several kinds and multitudes of figures, uniting all in the supreme head from which all excellences issue. We are soon surrounded, and the prey of the body of Bedouins who squat in a group at the corner of the Great Pyramid, but at the bidding of the all-powerful Sheikh, six men are singled out for the ascent. The steps if such they can be called, are blocks from two to four feet high and come nearly up to the waist of such a small person as myself. Therefore you stand and look doubtful as to how to ascend to the first one, but there is no time for much thought before the guides have seized you with a grasp that leaves its mark, and by main force you are lifted and dragged up, while at some of those still higher, the guide behind gives a heaving help and push. The exercise is violent. The sockets of your arms feel elongated. The muscles of the legs, particularly at the back, are aching. You feel that the disposal of your petticoats is getting higher than you like, but there is no time to stay. You scramble on somehow. 
hardly knowing how you are going to reach the next step before you are there. The Bedouins take you up at a tremendous pace and hardly give you time to breathe an occasional halt, but it is a good plan in that you have no time to hesitate whether you will turn back daunted. It is very dizzying work looking down on such layers and layers, such rows upon rows of yellow steps below, added to which the sudden change of temperature 500 feet higher makes respiration more difficult. When you arrive at the summit on the platform, you are too breathless and exhausted to enjoy the view much. The fertile valley of the Nile is on one side, but on the other there is the huge, vast, arid desert, the Great Sahara. It is that which determined me to ascend the pyramids. I wanted to gain the idea of what a desert can be when that and that alone is seen. It is very terrible. The Bedouins clamored around me, including the Sacha, or water carrier, who always accompanies the ascent, for bakshish and the sale of coins. And as C, having been up before, had stopped halfway, I was alone at the top and was fain to descend to be rid of them. The descent is far worse than the ascent. The jar to the system of jumping from step to step is very trying and it is really best to sit down on the step and slide over, however inelegant. The entrance to the pyramid is a little way up in the center of one side. The steps here are sunken sideways so as to form a slanting platform to a small aperture. Over this, there are two enormous blocks of marble laid pentwise to form an arch in the pyramid and to support its weight on the roof of the passage. You slip and slide down the steep passage, feeling you are going down into the bowels of the earth, the entrails of the Great Pyramid, and a last long slide brings you into the chamber. Here you see the material of which the pyramids are constructed, a rock called numelite limestone, often containing fossil remains. In one place it is rough and glistening, in another smooth and polished, as if worn away by what means is not known. In the roof there is a recess where the sarcophagus is supposed to have stood, but none was found when it was opened for the first time, as was supposed. In reality, the tomb had been opened and sacked probably not such an untold number of years after the death of Cheops. Then we walked ankle-deep in sand a quarter of a mile away to the southeast of the Great Pyramid, to where the Sphinx stands. Her whereabouts is only decided by a mass of rock that looks at first sight, please excuse the familiar simile, like the toadstool rock at Tombridge Wells, for it is only a mass of rock supported on a column. As we approach, however, and finally stand under the Sphinx, we begin to understand the fascinations she exercises. We see the Egyptian helmet with the long flaps under which are the protruding ears so very distinct. Then we notice the eyes, the forehead, the broken flattened nose, and the thick lips. It is in the lips lies the expression of the sphinx, the disdainful, haughty look, or anon the smile that parts them. The remainder of the face follows the mood expressed on the lips. But at all times the Sphinx is unsympathetic, cold as the stone she is carved in. With face turned toward the rising waters of the Nile, she changes not with the ruddy glow of sunset, nor the blush of morning, reflecting from its waters. She is human, but relentless. The animal body of the Sphinx is again buried in the sand, for once, a century ago, excavation revealed it. Between the front paws it was then found there was an altar where sacrifices must have been offered under the very head of the Sphinx herself, and a sanctuary with some tablets was discovered under the breast. 
Stanley said its situation and significance are worthy of the Sphinx. If it was the giant representative of royalty, then it fitly guards the greatest of royal sepulchres, and with its half-human and half-animal form is the best welcome and the best farewell to the history and religion of Egypt. Connected as it was supposed to be with her worship, the temple of the sphinx is peculiarly appropriate to her in its mastidity the enormous blocks of granite and alabaster laid lengthwise across other blocks on which we look down gives to it the appearance of the crypt of a cathedral the two remaining pyramids have no special interest nor yet the two or three others very small ones by comparison lying about the greater the latter are evidences of a very short reign, or perhaps were only intended to serve as a monument of sufficient height to ensure their never being sunk or overwhelmed with the sand typhoon of the desert. On Friday afternoon, the Sabbath of the Moslems, we went to see the religious service held by the sect of howling dervishes. Passing through a quiet court where the musicians were taking their places through an outer room, we came into a whitewashed mosque whose unornamented dome, as we shall presently see, has a splendid echo. A goatskin mat is arranged round in a circle on which the twenty or thirty worshippers enter one by one and kneel. The sheikh squats in the qibla or niche, and we sit on chairs ranged around the wall. The priest or sheikh intones some prayers to which all respond, the echo lingering and repeating the sonorous tones of the response, till it forms an accompaniment to the following prayer. Then they begin repeating the same word or phrase, Allah, 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 with a gentle inclination of the body. This action gradually increases with the rise of the voices, which, if they unconsciously flag for a minute, are vigorously taken up and maintained again. At a given sign from the sheik, they cease. All stand up. Then the same recommences with increased exercise and an occasional howl from some more devoted worshipper, while soft, wild music is heard outside. Gradually you are fascinated by this circle of men, all bowing at the same moment, all intoning on one note, and now it is a groaning noise they make, and it grows and grows, till the raising of the sheik's hands stops it once more. Then they take off their clothes, their turbans, and undo their long hair, and the real work of worship commences. The sheikh touches a man on the shoulder and singles him out to stand in the center. The swaying recommences, but with the violence where they left off as the first stage, and the dervish in the center leads, swaying, bending, all in time. Music strikes up, the tom-tom of large tambourines, a deafening discordant pandemonium to which they are moving in time, urged on by the increase and swell of the music faster ever increasing louder the music deafening its sound a circle of wild magnetic creatures tossing their locks of hair unconscious mechanical holding a mesmerized look on the dervish who with closed eyes performs with ecstasy the exercise of his salvation another steps into the circle and begins with arms outstretched slowly to turn and twirl round and round and round never moving from the exact spot of ground where he first took his stand gently at first increasing slowly becoming fast faster a whirl now all is utter confusion chaos has come the scene swims before your eyes the wild fanatical little body of surging swaying dervishes is becoming indistinct when a sudden raising of the finger brings it all to a close in an instant only one last resounding thud of the tom-tom one prolonged howl lingers on the echo the spinning dervish sinks exhausted to the ground saturday march seventh Lady Baring took me to the Visserines at home, 
on Saturday afternoon at Aachen Palace. We entered by a private way and back staircase and were shown through a succession of reception rooms to a small drawing room or boudoir where Her Highness sat. She is still young and has pretty features. All say she is most pleasant and good-natured, but she has grown and is growing enormously stout. The Visserin was arrayed in a Parisian toilette of black, and save for the representative feature of a bunch of red roses and diamond ornaments, looked completely European. The slaves, too, were dressed in English materials of old gold, blue, and pink silks, with gilt waistbands and bunches of roses, and not as one had looked to see them in some graceful oriental costume. We all sat round in a circle for the prescribed time, and cigarettes were offered and coffee brought, that nasty, bitter Arabian coffee, in tiny cups with Turkish stands. The same afternoon we called on Camille Barriere at the French Agency, the most beautiful house in Cairo just purchased by the French government. There are some very unique ceilings and mosaic dedos in it, and a great quantity of the pretty Mushrabeya. We dined in the evening with Nubar Pasha, the Prime Minister, and Madame Nubar, and after dinner went to a Turkish piece at the theatre. Quite half the galleries were curtained for the ladies of the harem, behind which we could see they were crowded, and when everyone left the house between the acts, it was from thence came the clouds of smoke that filled the theatre. Nubar Pasha is a very charming and courteous man. Sunday, March 8th. The premier very kindly lent us his Dahabia to go up the Nile. One always has a very mistaken idea about the beauty of the Nile. It is an exceedingly ugly river with shoals and sand lakes lying about in its course. Going up only a little way from Cairo, there is a fine view of the Mokatam Range. The citadel with the mosque of Muhammad Ali, whose slender minars tower as high again above the hills. Warehouses and manufactories, followed by mud villages, render the banks utterly hideous and uninteresting. The nuggers, with their sharp angled sails and enormously tall slanting masts, are alone pretty and picturesque. We return to Cairo as the sun was setting. Wednesday, March 11th, got up early, packed, drove to the station, took our seats in the train for Suez to embark on board the P&O Tasmania for Malta, Gibraltar, and Spain. Three minutes before the train started, bag and baggage we bundled out again. I saw in the paper there were fresh earthquakes in Spain, particularly at Malaga, where we must have landed from Gibraltar. We spent the day in Cairo and left again in the evening by the mail to Alexandria to go via Brindisi to Cairns. We drove through the streets of Alexandria by gaslight, seeing the remains of the bombardment on all sides. What a national reproach are the ruins and the houses partially riddled with cannon shot, the neat piles of broken brick and stone by the road. They are only just beginning to build Alexandria after a lapse of two years. We got on board the P&O mail steamer Assam at 11 o'clock and weighed anchor early next morning. Thursday, C-flat, calm. Friday, the shores of Crete and Candia in view, the bold outline of her mountains covered with snow. Saturday, within sight of beautiful Zante, an island of the Ionian group. A very rough night on board, half a gale blowing, and the next morning we are at Brindisi. Dear little Brindisi, though few will agree in this term of endearment, desolate and dreary as she is, greeting us with a snowstorm as she did, looked homelike and sweet to us, if only because she is so near home, a distance of no account after what we have done. The trees about the harbor were budding and breaking into blossom, notwithstanding the gray northeaster blowing. 
All day we were traveling along the leg of Italy, by the storm-swept ocean breaking in angry breakers along the shore. Across the fertile plains of Tuscany, Bologna reached at one in the morning left the next day to arrive at genoa the same evening then a day spent in crawling along the beautiful riviera its orange groves olive yards and flowers smiling us a sunshiny greeting cans reached at length that evening hearty welcomes home-like feelings renewing acquaintance with our little daughter vera a fortnight's pleasant rest after our long journey a gathering up of the thread of events, domestic and otherwise, since we left England in July last, and London reached on the 1st of April. Home at last. We had been absent not quite nine months, had traveled more than 40,000 miles, visited America and Canada, Australia and New Zealand, Netherlands, India, the Malay Peninsula, India and Egypt gained useful information without end, and laid up stores of knowledge that will never cease to be precious till our lives end. Had many and many a pleasant recollection left of little adventures, anecdotes, and incidents such as happen in common to all travelers, and made not a few interesting acquaintances. Let me finally take this opportunity of expressing to all the many kind friends particularly those in the colonies our gratitude for the hearty welcome and cheery hospitality extended to us by all should any one wish for nine months or better still a year of perfect enjoyment of rest and relief from the weary round of duty and so-called pleasure which is the life and lot of so many of us i say go a tour not round the world not mere globe-trotting but a complete tour of study through the glorious British Empire, such as we have tried to do, and failed only in that the Cape was, for circumstances already mentioned, impossible for us. In Greater Britain, all who are countrymen or women, all coming from the mother country, are sure of the same kindness and warm reception we have experienced. All are sure of great enjoyment, all are sure of a wealth of bright, pleasant memories for the future. Such has been our experience. To all I would say, go and do thou likewise. Written under circumstances of some difficulty, chiefly on board ship, in cabins close and dark, tossed and swung about, this journal has been put together. Poor little journal as it is, the first production of an unskilled pen, i am but too fully conscious of its defects it is up to date now the last entry has been made and with a sigh it has been confided to the hands of the printer and publisher may they and the public be merciful to it end of chapter twenty one part two end of forty thousand miles over land and water by ethel gwendolen bitson